if we convalescents still need art, it is another kind of art, a mocking, light, fleeting, divinely untroubled, divinely artificial art that like a pure flame licks into unclouded skies, above all, an art for artists only, right? Um, and, you know, this kind of like essentially this kind of gatekeeping uh, it's going to turn off quite a number of people, but I think, you know, for you and me, this is very yeah. exciting, right? And art for artists, right? <laughs> yeah. To be to yeah. be among people that actually understand, not those that, you know, pretend to understand, the people the, the people that actually understand. And, you know, uh, even if I disagree with some of the things he sa says about art, you know, in the kind of fundamental way, you know, Nietzsche is somebody that, that does uh, uh, understand. Oh my God. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Artifact number 39. I am joined by Laura Woods. She is a poet of substantial talent over in Ireland. And we're going to be discussing Nietzsche's uh, The Gay Science right? We both have the same edition. This is actually one of my most dog-eared books that I own. Uh, I've been reading it, uh, you know, about 10 years now, uh, returning it to it all the time. It's one of those wonderful books where uh, first time you read it, right, you're going to dog-ear a certain number of pages. Second time you read it, you will un- dog ear if that's uh, the term uh and dog ear other pages right um because you, things sort of like flit and out uh, in and out of your own consciousness uh your own kind of sort of uh, experiential feelings like Nietzsche the beginning in his preface right he says something along the lines of uh it's you know it, it's 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 hard to see uh who could truly understand this book that hasn't in fact experienced it right and as you get older right as you age as you accumulate experiences um you will come to see maybe some of the pronouncements and some of the uh, aphorisms a little bit differently from uh time to time right which is really i mean with any kind of great book uh that's an important sort of feature right and i would label this a great book i would label it a great book despite the fact that i would also say that in many respects it might be a, a flawed book an imperfect book uh nietzsche has some interesting commentary on the arts and also ideas uh, such as like artistic perfection right uh why maybe there's like some negatives to uh artistic perfection in the same way that i mean if you've been following this channel or the work of uh dan schneider over at cosmoetica.com right you'll you'll uh, know that these are some of the thoughts that we've also had for a while um but i mean let's uh l let's sort of uh get into it right so uh it's it's a it's a book that i believe it was written uh before thus spoke zarathustra because there's yeah. a pa yeah there's a passage here that uh it's i don't think it's written in this same exact way it's the same translator so i don't think it's the same passage yeah I believe it was like the original, like originally ended at book four, and then like book five is kind of like a thing appended to it, along with the prelude, or along with the preface and that. But um, the ending of book four kind of deliberately leads into Tostra, like it kind of is like a lead in, like the like the last aphorism directly mentions it, and it works mm -hmm. quite well in that regard. I I do think like while there's interesting aphorisms and interesting concepts in book five, and like the ending to that has its own merits. I do kind of. I, I do think there is something like kind of lost maybe and kind of losing that direct lead in and the kind of poetic quality that book four ends with. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, other than that, like I agree with like everything you've said about like it's a book you return to because like I kind of I think it's kind of like nice that like you've kind of developed with it and like been reading for 10 years for me like I read it first about a year and a half ago in 2021 and so I kind of have a bit of that experience I like return to it then kind of I returned to Nietzsche like last year then as I rereading it and I, I have kind of very much had that experience of like I, I have like certain underlines and stuff like that like from last time and I'd read it now and be like right there's definitely merit there but I kind of see them differently or there's other parts that stand out more to me and I think as well as that it's um something that I we probably come back to because I have a few specific kind of bits marked but like it's very much that like you'll have kind of 
I guess, like moral, philosophical, theological, but then also like psychological arguments and social observations that all sort of like kind of are occurring like adjacently in these aphorisms. But it's kind of, I think, goes along with the central concept of the book that there's not a necessary, like an easy, you know, there's no necessary any kind of like difference or like firm boundaries between all of those things. Like they're all very much linked and they're all very like there's relevance that can be brought within between those realms to each other. So I think that kind of lends it to itself to like, you know, just kind of, you know, just kind of interpreting things differently, picking up on different motifs, different like ways the arguments tend to go or different aspects of them that just are more relevant to you at that time, which is, yeah, I think it's definitely a very positive part of the experience of reading it. So, uh, you know, some of the criticisms, I guess, historically of the text, uh, which we could get into, uh, you know, mm -hmm. people complain that Nietzsche has uh, no explicit system, either in the philosophy or specifically in this book. I mean, I would recommend this book over anything else that he has written for people that are just getting into them for the first time. Because mm -hmm. something, you know, something like The Spoke Zarathustra, uh, there's much more of a kind of you know, purely fictive literary quality to it, although obviously it's a book of philosophy. Um, and, you know, parts of it is, it's uh, fairly uh, bloated in some parts, uh, despite it being, you know, absolutely, you know, just flat out great in others. Um, and, you know, there, there's books that Nietzsche has written that uh, dwell on maybe some of the kind of like more specifics of his philosophy, which means yeah. that for a, a generalist, right, you might get a little bit uh, bogged down in that. Uh, whereas the gay science, it's kind of like, you know, if you just read this book, you would probably get a great sense of more or less everything that he believes, right? Uh, yeah. About the arts, right? You don't even have to read, for instance, for instance, uh, The Birth of Tragedy, right? You would get yeah. a deep sense of his understanding of the arts. You would get a deep sense of his understanding about religion, about things like logic, about, uh, you know, the, the flow of history, Um so all of that, uh, so you, you, you know, people complain about, uh, the fact that he doesn't have an explicit system. Another complaint is for all of his uh, talk about, uh, you know, the, the transvaluation of values. He does seem to posit this idea that his own kind of replacement values, right? For like whatever world values that he sees in, in Germany or whatever in the 1800s, uh, he, uh, he seems to be positing that his replacement values are in fact superior, you know, objectively so. And uh, I, I find this kind of interesting because uh, you know, there's, some, there's something very attractive with this idea of uh, we need to get at objectively better values, right? So, um, but he, he seems to be positing, right, objective values. And uh, I think maybe the best way to get at it, uh, especially for us, uh, would be through the fact that, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, since we're artists, right, you and I are both artists, and he's focusing on the arts, this entire idea of some of these objectively uh, superior values would come about through art in some way, right, by by way of a tangent, right, uh, you know, implicitly, perhaps in some parts explicitly, right, so we'll, we'll get into some of these questions of, of values. Uh, the last so, thing by way of introduction is just this, the idea of like Nietzsche as, as a great stylist, right, a lot of people, like whether it's like Steven Pinker, who's extremely critical of uh, Nietzsche. In fact, I, I did this uh, video with Jill Parrish. It was one of the early artifacts from a couple of years ago where we went through uh, Stephen Pinker's book, um, Enlightenment Now, where uh, it, it has a uh, chapter where he's just basically attacking Nietzsche, right? And I found that chapter to be just kind of very silly and also kind of hypocritical and just kind of motivated. Like if Nietzsche were to read some of those criticisms, right, he would say this is so obviously motivated psychologically by uh, Pinker's yeah. inability just to deal with maybe his own guilt, right? Having yeah. to do with the fact that, you know, he's a well-to-do Canadian who uh, is working on a laptop, you know, made from slave labor, and he's essentially standing upon the corpses of millions of people before him. And that's just kind of the reality of how history works, right? And uh, yeah. Pinker in this kind of like arrow of progress, even if we could sort of concede in some ways this idea of an arrow of progress, uh, the, the same people that, that talk about an arrow of progress would be very uncomfortable talking about the corpses they are presently, not in the past, not in some kind of abstraction, but presently standing upon yeah. to do the work that they do, right? And Nietzsche, Nietzsche sort of lays this out, you know, uh, quite out there in terms of like, um, 
you know, uh, if there is a will, if this is all about a will to power, right, to sort of contrast this with Schopenhauer's uh, will to life, if this really is a will to power, you have to own it, you have to stand on. And if you are standing upon corpses, you better make sure that the work that you're producing, the things that you're doing are uh, of value, right? Objective value, right? Yeah. To get back into this idea. Um, but but anyway, what I wanted to say was, uh, so Pinker would have this critique and others might have this critique, but they would all yeah. concede. But Nietzsche still happens to be a great stylist, right? And I and always I, find, I yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, like regarding the Pinker thing, no, you're grand. But before the pink, we just move on, I want to say regarding the Pinker thing, I've always, I, I seen that like earlier video did and I found that quite, interesting and like i agree about the hypocrisy because funnily enough um one of the things i remember and i think it was one of the original notes i made in this book while reading back on it is um some of the concepts that nietzsche kind of starts to like talk and especially in book three that he sort of um, really starts to develop are like these kind of I, I suppose you could talk about like the idea that like um even a lot of like so he like specifically critiqued ideas like cause and effect and things like that but he kind of it's generally like when we're perceiving things we're doing so through the parameters of what we are able to perceive the human brain can perceive which is like influenced by like how it's evolved what evolutionary was useful for allow us to survive and so on and i found it quite like kind of funny when you were bringing up that specific critique pinker made because my first introduction to that exact concept was back when i was reading pinker's books as a teen and like he has i think it's in the stuff of thought um he he has a fine i think it's this final chapter actually deals with that exact concept like uh, in regards to like things like philosophy science you know all these big questions and he sort of broaches the concept without crediting nietzsche if i remember rightly that like or you know that you know you sort of maybe the human brain has not evolved in so like in such a way that these things are necessary like to comprehend such things as perhaps the meaning of life or an objective reality or whatever and like he, he kind of and like obviously like that would have been one of my first earlier introductions this kind of idea because i read it as a teenager but it's kind of like i, I it makes me think i kind of just show off as like a certain shallowness in pinker's critique of them and it makes me think that a lot of his critique is more of a social like you're kind of bringing up it's more of a social signal than anything else it's more like oh the sort of people that I don't want to be associated with like Nietzsche, you know, like these, like me, like whatever he's imagining. Like, I think he brings up the whole Nazi association, which is pretty serious in itself as well. Like, but also what you bring up about like the way he's implicating this very idea, but also like ideas that, you know, he himself has discussed in that were ones that Nietzsche were very presciently discussed like years before. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, but you know, even in these critiques, right? He and others would would concede. Oh, you know, Nietzsche is is a great stylist, right? Um, and I find that yeah. a very kind of deflation. You can't really deny it, like yeah. But 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 even so, it seems to me uh, highly sort of deflationary, right? In the sense that uh, he is so lacking, but at least he has great style. Like the fact is. Um, uh, in the vast majority of cases, I mean, there's always like some exceptions, but in the vast majority of cases, uh, when it comes to, you know, anybody that is like substantively dealing with ideas, I mean, like you could disagree uh, or agree with uh, Nietzsche's ideas, but he is in fact, uh, in different ways, substantively dealing with those ideas. Once you also on top of substantively mm -hmm. dealing with ideas, introduce great writing, great style, whatever. Uh, that really changes the nature of those ideas. I don't think people sufficiently appreciate this fact. Uh, you yeah. could disagree with 75% of mm -hmm. uh, what this book states, but the fact is, because it's written you know, uh, sufficiently well, you could always find some kind of way, some kind of sentence, some kind, even, even if it's like a passage that you wholeheartedly disagree with, you're going to find sentences and nuggets and, and other items uh, that you could sort of refashion in your own way. You could even, you know, uh, theoretically uh, have, you know, from one aphorism to the next, you know, a set of uh, perhaps contradictory ideas and whatever synthesis that you could create, you would be able to point to yeah. the style itself that's allowing you to create a, a synthesis that, you know, is harder to disagree with in a yeah. kind of, you know, purely, you know, a conceptual, or whatever, like ideal level. Um, so, uh, just, uh, I, I would always, uh, to the, to the audience, right. I I'm going to caution them when people start saying stuff like Nietzsche, uh, is a great stylist, but keep in mind that they're being very deflationary in terms of what this actually means. And this is not just Nietzsche, right? This applies to, yeah. uh, anybody, right. And, and people often get that a little bit confused. You can also talk though about the fact that like the way something, it's like, you can't just separate 
form and function like if you can have a great idea like to be honest and, and like you know even as artists i mean there's times especially when you're like starting out that you have something that in theory could be a great idea but you do not have the skills yet to be able to phrase it and uh, to really put it across in a way that does it justice and like then in itself it's like you're losing something of this idea you're maybe you know just deflating it by using a cliche or something so it's sort of like it's this false dichotomy between like great ideas and because you know you have people that have ideas of substance that are phrased badly but you also have plenty of like philosophy that's really lost something because people cannot fucking convey their ideas very well mm -hmm. in general and it's like if the idea is just remaining great inside their skull but not actually getting out into the world you know what like i don't know what good really is that in a sense like it's just mm -hmm. yeah it's kind of a false dichotomy i think but yeah, otherwise yeah i agree with your point and then you also have a category of people that uh, they could have uh, good and correct ideas, but by virtue of the fact that they start writing about them, um, uh, they're just totally miscommunicating what, in mm -hmm. fact, that, you know, like I, I remember I did this uh, uh, essay on this guy. I forget I forget the name of the scientist, uh, something Hoffman. If you look at, you know, alexsherman.com, you'll it find quantum, it. Something to do with like quantum physics and stuff. Uh, I think I vaguely remember that one. Well, he, uh, he he was basically making the argument, right? So it's a Nietzschean argument of like, um, yes. you know, uh, uh, basically uh, uh, we are biologically wired not for mm. truth and reality. We're wired for survival um, yes, yeah. and yeah, passing on that. genes, which, which means that, you know, reality is in fact different than many of the perceptions. But the way that he often phrases that and the way that others, uh, maybe even perhaps less than he does, but the way that others would jump on this, right? Those that sort of have a much more kind of relativist perspective on the world, deny objective reality, that kind of thing. They would start saying, oh yeah, obviously there's no such thing as objective reality, or you can't get at objective reality, you know, which is false, right? And that's just yeah. like, that's just the, that's just using language and correctly and, and many you know many scientists are guilty of this all the time yeah, yeah. right um so anyway maybe we could get into uh some of the writing itself i think something you mentioned earlier about like just uh, what he says about art and stuff and i think like it's maybe a start in that in the preface um he kind of like he actually i believe refers to himself as an artist at one point where he talks about art i'll try and find a specific quote but um i think that that's sort of something that adds an interesting element to his conversation about art and you know maybe you can talk about some of the flaws in it but there's also some interesting ideas that he brings up that i think are actually quite you know ahead of their time in some ways like he'll talk about like art as illusion rather than art as truth and the sort of like and then which i think is a true thing in itself he also uses the segue into the idea of like you know just i suppose those like hoffman-esque ideas that you're talking about there and like some of the like you know the problems with the concept of truth in general but even just taken in itself as a statement on art rather than as an allegory for that it's like it's it's very like it's reminiscent of like a lot of what like you know in our little circle and that dan will also talk about you know like art is not truth and so on you know mm -hmm. so it's kind of um i do think like there's an aspect of then like a lot of what he says about art is perhaps kind of like um, I, I, I don't know, I think there's nearly a sense you can kind of give him leeway or not even leeway, you can sort of accept some of the seeming inconsistencies and some of the like oddities in the book as being like sort of part or like lending to this overall concept. Like, I, I don't know, it's quite kind of interesting in that respect, like goes along notion to that, like when he talks about philosophy, that it's deriving from these sort of, you know, personal needs these like psychological or these even physiological or instinctive or like although he doesn't use this term I, I i can't really remember if i've ever read anything about him being explicitly familiar with darwin's work but i feel it's definitely something in the water around this time that like you you have this general sense like these evolutionary roots that lie behind these things like it's not that when somebody is talking what is true it's like well what need does this serve for them so it's sort of like in it in and of itself i feel like there's this weird nearly self-excusing thing that you can sort of look at it and see like some of maybe Maybe the flaws or some of the parts where you might disagree with points as being well after all this is just indicative of the fact that this is in a way a document of himself as a philosopher and the ways these things might have filled his own personal needs his own perspective on that so like i think that that's one of the things that really like lends that literary quality of the book it's like it, it's in a sense like even the bits where like whereas like a typical book of philosophy is that like if you pick apart the logical flaws or say this is wrong well then it's kind of useless in a sense you know you if, if something does not ring true to you then it is essentially put out of use in this you can say ah yes but that is simply like lending weight to like his another overall idea of his 
So I think this is especially like something that's a decent point to make regarding which I think we should talk about some of the like famously or notoriously sexist parts in some of his mm -hmm. writing. So, yeah, um, I, I have I have a specific aphorisms on that, and, and that's the yeah. thing. Like, interestingly enough, like uh, some of those sexist aphorisms, uh, they end they're in not, a they're much more nuanced. Yeah, yeah, they, they uh, like uh, he ends uh, that section on women with a, with a uh, with an aphorism section that is just like so ahead of its time in terms yeah. of like discussing yeah. female sexuality, right? So, uh, but I mean, we'll get into that, but and also uh, like. Yeah, we we'll get onto that later. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, but but um, so like, I mean, we could tell already, right? Like, we haven't even like uh, discussed any of the specific quotes yet. We're still in the preface, yeah. so this might be a pretty long show uh, for viewers of uh, uh, Artifact, right? You guys know we have a Patreon page, so Laura and I are going to continue this conversation after the public show is over. We're probably going to still talk a bunch about Nietzsche and the rest of the book. I mean, because there's just so much to get through. We could literally sit here for like six, seven hours. So a chunk of that will be in the after show. But anyway, let's let's talk a little bit about this uh, preface, right? So Great this is the way... Preface, yeah. Yeah, this is the way that it begins, right? And this is preface to the second edition. Um, I'm not sure if he had a preface to the first edition, but... Uh, this, I think this... that was all added on, like as far as I know. Yeah, um, it just had the first book one to like had the I think the like, like little rhymes at the start and then books one to four and that was it during the first one. Yeah, and you know it's interesting because like this this preface even by itself like is just fantastic. You know, several pages of writing, so uh, it's definitely a critical part of the book. Uh, this is the way that he begins. This book may need more than one preface, and in the end, there would still remain room for doubt whether anyone who had never lived through similar experiences could be brought closer to the experience of this book by means of prefaces. It seems to be written in the language of the wind that thaws ice and snow. High spirits, unrest, contradiction, and April weather are present in it, and one is instantly reminded no less of the proximity of winter than of the triumph over the winter that is coming must come and perhaps has already come so i mean just a fantastic way to begin things it, it also has a, an interesting kind of parallel to some of the specifics that he discusses later on about uh yeah. just this uh, just this idea of, of of you know whatever uh truth or whatever kind of opinion that you come to right this is sort of like interesting little feature of the book uh it's you can only come to it and see it as truth accept it as truth because there's various parts of you that have been prepared for that truth, have been prepared yeah. for that reality. Um, I often say, for instance, like, yeah, uh, it's it's great that I dis discovered Dan Schneider and Cosmoetica.com. When I was a teenager, I uh, there used to be a time in the 2000s when if you would ever Google anything about poetry, specific poets, you would inevitably come across Dan's site. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's a reason why I was able to maybe uh, uh, start to accept some of his judgments, whereas, you know, other people would simply not, right? There's something, yeah. you know, they're, 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 and, and I, I, I think maybe like in the long term, right, when it comes to sort of discussing the arts, you might want to figure out a way to uh, bring everybody else in. Uh, like, yeah. is, is there a way to, for instance, like, get people on my side, for instance, of viewing uh, the arts, uh, that are not maybe like totally prepared for, or is that like a yeah. totally logical statement? Like, like is, is it ipso facto? Like, do, do do you have to be essentially somehow prepared a type for, it, for of you? Person, to... yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, it's um, and, and 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 that type, you know, it does not even have to be like inborn. It could simply be a set of experiences, you know, up until yeah. that point of revelation, right? So it does, well, it doesn't have to be inborn either. That's actually interesting because one of the things when I was looking back through my notes about this from a year and a half ago when I first read it. Um, I actually remember kind of having like having a thought and I kind of was jotting down some things and like one of the things that I found and I still would kind of stand by this was um, I kind of think like the difference maybe between art and philosophy is that like art sort of creates the conditions for its own understanding like it sort of primes mm -hmm. the reader or viewer or whatever to understand it creates a whole narrative or a whole you know even if it's like a piece of music or picture it uses certain things that are like light up the brain in certain ways that prime them to like get into this state of mind or to accept this idea to accept what's being presented to them and I sort of think that that's like yeah, I would say that that is kind of the difference between art and philosophy in that sense. And I sort of think that like you're kind of whereas a philosophy, it does even a great work of philosophy like this to some extent. Yeah, it still does depend on you coming across at the right time. Whereas I feel with art, if you're receptive and open to it, 
I, again, it does its own work to prepare you. It gets, it's like it lets you in. It opens a little side entrance to get you in the like side, the back door, past the crowds, past all the locks, and it's on the front, you know. Um, but I do think that like in a work philosophy like this, compared to most, like that, like even just the quality of the writing, the quality, of the concept, the fact it gives you this psychological hook that so many can resonate with, does have a bit of that priming effect that sort of belies what he's saying there about not being able to understand it. But also, in addition to that, like, I think that particularly resonated with me because when I first read this, just to get, I suppose, like, uh, like a personal element to it. And like, I, I'm kind of wondering if you've maybe experienced something similar, because I know we've talked before regarding some like things of chronic illness and that. I remember, like, there's a sort of stereotypical idea of Nietzsche in like the, in pop culture, I guess, or the public thing is, you know, like the very, you know, sort of. This, this, this essentially very hard as very tyrannical there's the association with nazism which you know it's, i think is kind of spurious but like you know and so on and then when you actually read this and it's sort of like you know that this whole might is right you know like like the will to power and the sort of connotations like a lot of grown up around that um, usually among people who haven't even read his stuff and it's sort of like when you read this and read this stuff and you see like he was very much he very much used and was very like open about the fact he used his ex own experience with like chronic illness and chronic pain as something that he can he very much seemed to consider this like a key part of himself and a key part of what developed his own personal philosophy and what shaped it and actually just from what i've read even the aphoristic sort of style he wrote in was actually directly influenced by the restrictions that upon his life because he was going blind he couldn't be there writing it down he needed to dictate his writing his own and the easiest way to do that was to like write these little scraps and jot them down and then sort of say them to somebody who would then write it down which is so it's very much something that like in itself like you can sort of see how like this is coming from like these kind of experience these limitations this like struggling he went through kind of did influence directly is what happened and like I know when I came and that kind of fascinated me because both like I was kind of like I was like struggling at the time I read this and up until relatively recently I was kind of had some chronic pain issues and stuff like that had been going on for years since a pretty young age and I also was working in healthcare so like the kind of element a lot we talked about was very viscerally resonant with me in a way that kind of like not just intellectually but sort of um, like I really got what he was talking about this was something that I was directly experiencing because I was sort of going on a time of sort of trying to put myself out there I was reading much more again I'm starting to write again on a like I guess a personal emotional level I was kind of put my out there so a lot of what he describes in this preface and like I, I feel like we can nearly read like to quote the thing is difficult because it is just beautiful writing there's sort of a lot that just like that did sort of fall, I, I kind of I guess I did fit the exact description that he gives of like you know somebody who did have these similar experiences who was very much individually primed to understand this as well uh, and like he it just has some like beautiful but at the same time it works but on that level but also sets it up like it says um <sighs> I, I, I actually I'll quote in a minute I'm just wondering if maybe you've experienced anything similar in your like when you first read the book or in returning to it since I mean yeah uh back in um like like it was like almost 15 years ago I had this like big like adrenal crash from like I was in I was in Greece at the time and I was uh, I was drinking like tons of coffee the the, the Nescafe like oof wonderful right yeah. Nescafe in morning Nescafe at night a big thing of like you know milky coffee in the middle of the day I was taking like a, a men's uh, multivitamin um before like I really understood you know sufficiently about supplements uh, I'm still like totally a supplement freak but I'm mm -hmm. much more cir circumspect and much more balanced about these kinds of things but I, I was taking this uh, multivitamin that had this like a stimulant in it called Yohimbe which uh oh, yeah. they which uh, they they don't uh, uh <laughs> use anymore in the supplement after, yeah. what, after what happened to me I noticed oh they took it out I wonder why and so so anyway they took it out by the time there was this like major uh, adrenal crash for me and it was just like a crazy set of experiences for like six months and i was like shit am i ever gonna get better how am i ever? like i remember like when it happened like uh, i remember uh, uh, writing an email to jessica just trying to explain to her what happened over the past week and it took me literally a week to uh write that email because i only I could only do like a sense at a time because i just literally couldn't think and i was like damn am i am i ever going to be able to write again am i ever going to be able to do anything again um and uh you know when my strength was coming back and i uh became like more or less normal after the fact and uh uh you know you know he, he does say like for instance like 
uh, right after what I read, gratitude pours forth continually as mm -hmm. if the unexpected had just happened. The gratitude of a convalescent, for convalescence was unexpected. Gay science, that signifies the Saturnalia of a spirit who has patiently resisted a terrible, long pressure, patiently, severely, coldly, without submitting, but also without hope, and who is now all at once attacked by hope, the hope for health, and the intoxication of convalescence. Mm -hmm. um, I recently wrote a poem uh, where it uses the word hope as a kind of like fulcrum, which is gonna, I'm going to put up in the next few days or so, um, or kind of like uh, maybe making fun of this uh, idea a little bit, but also just kind of like this idea that, um, yeah, like uh, – uh, uh, like think about uh, like everything that he says uh, that that uh, we might disagree with about war and about struggle, and yet there is something to the idea. Uh, for me, I'm sure for you, yeah. and also mm -hmm. clearly for him, uh, the fact that we went through kinds of like chronic illnesses, uh, it definitely strengthens you in very kind of uh, unexpected yeah. ways. Yeah, I I think as well like. It's kind of a bit more, and like what I really appreciate about Strance things is that it's a bit deeper than I guess the pop culture stuff that's absorbed out and like what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And like this, this like older idea, I suppose, of like, you know, suffering builds character and stuff. And I think it's a bit more nuanced. And I would uh, like in the sense when he talks about it, is that like it can bring character. It doesn't necessarily for everyone, which is pretty clear. Like, I mean, suffering and struggling can absolutely ruin people and destroy potential. But for some people, it can be the sort of catalyst or spur or fulcrum upon which like that develops and it's just like again like I worked in healthcare I very much like and I at the time I was working in a hospital when like when I was reading this and then like I could very much like relate this and sort of see this in examples of people that you know, like some people would sort of take when something happened and they just crumble and that I'm not saying this in a judgmental sense and I don't even think that like you know like there's <sighs> There can be somewhat of a harshness in the way he talks about these things, but I think they're like, I mean, like we're saying with the contradictions, there can be a sort of sense that like, you know, it's acceptance of it is difficult. Like sometimes, like I would have seen people that just sort of could not cope with maybe certain stress. And I personally think that's incredibly understandable. And it's like, there's a whole bunch of factors that are going on that plays into why they maybe could not deal with like becoming suddenly ill and dealing with this, where some people kind of, where some people simply could. And some people manage like have this like wellspring of sort of like, I guess, will or whatever to sort of push through their illness to deal with recovery, to do everything that needed to be done. And it's just like, even myself, like I found times when I'm feeling like shit and I just, I just like, I'm like, no, I, I just simply feel like I can't deal with it. And other times when it's just like, it just feels natural to sort of push through and do that. So yeah, I, I think though it, it can, it really can be the catalyst. I think it just takes that you need to sit, like sort of take it and sort of have an attitude of like a generativeness or whatever that like these things that are happening to you and I do think it ties back into like art maybe is one of the maybe one of the best ways but also one of the most effective ways to do that do you know like it's one of the most effective ways in which you can simply turn something that you like happened to you and write a poem about it or do something and it is producing something of, that is simply of worth if you do it well you know mm -hmm. um Whereas like, but again, that's not necessarily accessible to everyone. So it is like, it, it kind of, I guess, does come with caveats. Like at the same time, I think sometimes some of the things people get from suffering and struggle are a bit more complex, especially in the personal or emotional or social realm. Like, you know, some people become hardened and, and you can argue that like that was a necessity to get through with it, but then it has like other effects or knock on effects on relationships or on mm -hmm. um things that like, you know, the way they treat others or like the way, you know, so it's kind of, it, it is a bit more nuanced in a sense, I guess. And I think that there is room within the way he discusses this to allow for that nuance that again, like the pop, like the pop cultural, or even you see like him being name checked, I guess, in an attempt to seem deep, like, you know, we've mentioned before, like the Jordan Peterson name checking of Nietzsche and stuff like that. Yeah, this, he so. doesn't, you know, like yeah. it's, 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 it's kind of fascinating how many people, for instance, would watch uh, a, a Peterson video in Nietzsche, but they would never actually go and actually read these books. Um, mm -hmm. and it, you know, again, and it's also not very clear to me, just like with Pinker and with, uh, uh, Peterson, it's not clear to me that they have ever actually truly read Nietzsche, right? I mean, yeah, they Pinker might, they especially. might talk about it. Yeah. P yeah. Pinker, especially, um, you know, some of the, cause I mean, like many of the mistakes that they would make are very sort of elementary mistakes. Um, but I anyway, mean, th th this idea of, uh, you know, this, this hardening, right. From sickness, uh, 
It's especially in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, right? The word like hardness uh, plays a very important role uh, in that text. And also, I, I forget if it's mentioned to whatever degree in the gay science, but... Uh, I think in, it's touched on a little bit, like, but more obliquely, kind of. Yeah, so, like, you know, this idea of hardness, um, you know, to, to Nietzsche, this is a positive, right? Mm. Uh, the problem yeah. uh, with, you know, to the extent that he doesn't have a system is... Uh, a lot of what he says does not exactly like it doesn't scale up right in in the kind of like social way in a way that it yeah, ought yeah. right and, yeah. and Nietzsche would sort of maybe dismiss that he would dismiss uh, you know groups groups of people that aren't necessarily uh, for instance let's say getting something of positive value yeah from or they from can't get the same kinds of value from it as others yeah. can like for example an artist writing a, a poem or a novel or a great piece of music inspired you know like not everyone can do that or not yeah. everyone can turn it into something productive yeah yeah to, to him it would be like well if they're not able to deal with and others can <laughs> the others that can they're simply filling in you know like a kind of like a, a let's just call it like a will to power sort of niche right yeah. they're sort of filling yeah. in that niche that these others uh, do not so in a sense everybody else you know but being a kind of negation of this they become kind of like the fuel right for this uh yeah. present you know kind of trajectory up um and so uh so the, uh, you touched on the sort of the artistic parts uh on in the preface and uh another important part here is so he, he takes this idea of uh you know his own convalescence right and he's since he's so kind of influenced by his own feelings and this is the irony he starts making sort of objective arguments about you know yeah. the philosophy of the past but it's kind of based on the subjective experience of like well if yeah. i was so profoundly affected by my own sickness and now my own convalescence um it means that you know these other philosophers right they must have been in yeah. some ways either profoundly sick or profoundly healthy and all of this yeah, is now this dichotomy like yeah yeah and all of this is now playing out so um in but the, i think like that like i said though i do think that is like one of the key things that makes this a great book because like it is a great conceit in that like, sense that he sort of like like I say, he sort of weaves into it this very like a refutation against anyone who's going to say, well, that's not like objective. That's not any saying, well, none of it is like this isn't proving my point, you know? It's like, mm -hmm. which it's a great little gambit. Like, whether you agree or disagree or say, like, you know, it invalidates it partly philosophically or whatever, I just, you got to respect it. <laughs> then it's like, it's, mm -hmm. it's a great conceit. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, he has the bit then where it kind of talks about. He kind of has a bit of like conclusions or consolations and then later he kind of returns that a bit and says like this whether okay one now knows whether the sick body and its needs unconsciously urge push and lure the spirit towards the sun stillness mildness patience medicine bam in some sense every philosophy that ranks peace above war every ethic with a negative definition of happiness every metaphysics and physics that knows some finale some final state of some sort, every predominantly aesthetic or religious cravings for some apart, beyond, outside, above, permits the question whether or not it was sickness that inspired the philosopher. The unconscious disguise of phy physiological needs under the cloaks of the objective ideal, purely spiritual, goes to frightening lengths. And I often I've asked myself whether, taking a large view, philosophy has not merely been merely an interpretation of the body and a misunderstanding of the body. So yeah, that's kind of it. It is a very like broad and sort of like audacious statement to make. And he he ultimately uh, uh, finishes this idea by by saying, um, "I'm still waiting for a philosophical physician in the exceptional sense of the word." One who has one who has to pursue the problem of the total health of a people, time, race, or of humanity, to muster the courage to push my suspicion to its limits and to risk the proposition. What was at stake in all philosophizing hitherto was not at all truth, but something else. Let us say health, future, growth, power, life, right? Uh, he's sort of starting to touch on this idea that he develops more fully later on. Uh, that, yeah. you know, it's not so much truth that people are after, right? It's everything that's kind of orbiting this idea that, you know, truth becomes a kind of virtue signal, but really they're after not only yeah. something else, but also they are misleading about, about the stakes. And selfish. Yeah. Like, yeah. and I think as well, it's interesting to know, and this is again, something that comes up later is that like, and it also comes up, um, I read um, his his earlier book, Dawn or The Daybreak, or like it's Morgenruta in German, and um, however that ends up translated various ways in English. 
I've kind of seen that that was the book immediately before this and I read a different translation of it like I mean as in a different like not Kaufman someone else but like I've kind of often seen that referred to as like it's the start of his more him coming into his own and his sort of mature philosophy I, I don't know whether you agree with that or not or kind of want to discount beyond good and human or the tragedy in sense but it does it is definitely his person where he starts kind of playing around some ideas that he really brings to fruition here and one of the things is he talks a lot about like he, he himself or what he's doing as psychology or psychologists and the needs of that and this sort of crops up again here and I think it's kind of interesting when you look at this whole passage we're after referencing um, because it is something that like when I'm reading this I couldn't help thinking of like kind of philosophy ha or psychology has probably been the thing that's really taken and run with what he's talking about here like when he talks about the philosophical physician and the pursuing the problem of total health I kind of was thinking of like so-called positive psychology so like you did your earlier show on Maslow and then you also have like people like Carl Rogers who like you know coined the term like positive psychology so overall it's like let's not look at like just all these like you know examples of you know neuroses and kind of things are gone wrong let's look at what it might mean to be a, like a fully healthy individual or to kind of take those most and it's like I, I like from what little I've read I'm not sure how much that was something but it does strike me as quite Nietzschean even if it, their conclusions might like differ from Nietzsche's it is kind of it, it does seem like he was probably the first to really talk about thing, these things in these terms um I also think like relating to the whole Maslow thing I um like given that you did the earlier show on that is it's like when the way he talks about sick philosophy here it like bears a lot of resemblance to the whole concept of like deficiency needs or this kind of mm. whole idea that like Maslow talks about and that you also see in like that kind of realm of psychology like it's a very similar concept in that like these things are coming from people trying to gratify some need or some lack in themselves rather than being like so basically it ends up to like it ends up being sort of a need and it's to do with filling this hole rather than do be like the, truly dealing with the outside world and as a sort of over spilling of of like your own like sense you know your, your own sense of I have enough now let's face the outside world it's sort of like I have this lack so I need the outside world to gratify me which I think do think is like whether or not you want like you want to agree entirely with like the implications of him like tarring the entire path of philosophy with this it is something that has like the, this general idea is something that crops up again and again and is at the root of a lot of psychology and psychoanalysis like in like the thing came after I, I sort of think that like Nietzsche is probably like the progenitor in some ways I think Freud even acknowledged like Nietzsche's like influence and importance in his own ideas and that so it's kind of I, I think that's probably been one of his biggest influences in a way um yeah it, it's one of those interesting things about him where um you know, like a, a present day, like modern person, I don't think you could take uh, at face value and accept, you know, everything that he would say, for instance, about women, mm, yeah. about politics, uh, uh -huh. the ten the tendencies uh, that he has that are just kind of like, you know, fascistic, like, that's not to say that he race would at all thing or talking about like race, as in not like black and white or whatever, but more so the German race, the like, mm -hmm. the southern Mediterranean race, like, I think that's one of the things that notably stands out to me as coming across as quite dated compared yeah. to like yeah. the more like really hyper present shit that he talks about elsewhere so yeah. yeah 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 that's the thing like you you would have to reject you know a good chunk of uh some of his conclusions but at the same time you know with all the names that we just mentioned and others and you know people like myself whose politics are completely different from from yeah. uh, Nietzsche like that's the thing like I could if I want I could create you know such a compelling like left wing you know case for Nietzsche right you could do yeah. that right <laughs> oh, there's absolutely. no there's no reason that you can't do that people are people are like that's the thing about you know and, but that's where he is like correct about you know the uh the whole set of like you know um you know uh resentments among you know let's just call them today he wouldn't you know use this phrasing back then but like left-wing types yeah uh, you know the whole kind of state morality have a they're, so, they're, they're so, they're so scared I... about it you know they're so they're so scared yeah. of like somebody yeah. like Nietzsche like oh no, no no we can't possibly use this for our own you know project you know they're even scared of using somebody like Pinker for their own project mm -hmm. like his work on like human violence and stuff like that they're very you know and and um th th those are the portions that's the thing even when you start critiquing Nietzsche you know from let's say like a left-wing perspective perspective uh you'll start noticing all the kind of deficiencies of your own you know uh kind of like left-wing trot maybe not your own politics but the people around you right yeah. that need to prefigure so you know these people are they're, they're constantly influenced by him even if they have to reject you know substantial portions still th there's there's no way of escaping so much of this yeah 
Like it's definitely like I, I think that's one of the like benefits in a way when you talk about like oh like the, the critique of him like lacking a system. It is sort of a benefit. Like it, it might be sort of like again playing along what he says about like people who sort of obsess over truth and the idea of truth versus like survival and like the, and stuff like that it's like sort of like right his lack of a system in that sense might like damn him among like more like rigid philosophical types but it definitely does a hell of a lot more for the overall survival of his like the memes of his ideas to use like in the dark and sense dark and sense like it's sort of like there's there's like so many things that like any given person could pick out and sort of like use and like do that and repurpose it in a way that like I, I think like it's much harder to do that you end up not being able to do that with the more rigidly systematical kind of types of philosophizing so some of this like uh final aspect in, in the preface about the arts right um uh and and this is one thing that gets me right like he's uh you know he's a philosopher obviously but i think he's much more than a you know a generic philosopher right he's also very much an artist right and i mm -hmm. i do wonder how much of the resentment from the kind of you know conventional philosophical world they're like this isn't real philosophy like where's all the like how many how much of it is just like a reaction just in the niche and psychological sense of like uh the fact that most philosophers are essentially like little scriveners right they're little scriveners who you know have like little citations somewhere and have like little you know uh nuggets of this or that that they say but they're not able to produce stuff like this right they're not able to be artists right which is a, a more kind of um you know it, it's it's it, it, it's a it's a philosophy that uh, has much more of a kind of like arrow quality to it. It keeps moving, right? It keeps yeah. floating. It keeps recreating itself. And and this is what he says uh, in terms of like this convalescent art. Uh, no, if we convalescents still need art, it is another kind of art, a mocking, light, fleeting, divinely untroubled, divinely artificial art that like a pure flame licks into unclouded skies, above all, an art for artists only right um and you know this kind of like essentially this kind of gatekeeping uh it's going to turn off quite a number of people but i think you know for you and me this is very yeah. exciting right and art for artists right <laughs> yeah. to be to yeah. be among people that actually understand not those that you know pretend to understand the people the, the people that actually understand and you know uh, even if i disagree with some of the things he sa says about art you know in the kind of fundamental way you know nietzsche is somebody that that does uh, uh understand um and maybe we could uh, finish uh, with this like final little comment he says um, uh, about back to the city of truth. No, this bad taste, this will to truth, to truth at any price, this youthful madness in love and the love of truth have lost their charm for us. For that, we are too experienced, too serious, too merry, too burned, too profound. We no longer believe that truth remains truth when the veils are withdrawn. We have lived too much to believe this. Today, we consider it a matter of decency, not to wish to see everything naked or to be present at everything or to understand and know everything. I'm not sure if you have a comment about this specifically now, but I'm going to, for myself, just keep this idea in mind as we go through the rest of the book and sort yeah. of like respond to it. Yeah, because I think like it is something that like I noticed comes up like again or it's an idea that's developed more and kind of gets like more and more implications because like it's one of those things like when you read this first you sort of have a certain assumption about what that might mean or what that's kind of been around what truth means but like definitely like the concept of like what he's referring to when he says truth versus illusion is like developed more and more in a, in a few quite a few different ways over the course of the book so, yeah yeah I mean, that's is. the thing i i, I think uh, what ends up happening is um you know, because right now we have a lot of like, it's in fashion to be a kind of like, I guess you could call it like a naive skeptic, right? Where, you know, objective yeah. reality doesn't exist, right? The more, let's just imagine the most crass form of like naive skepticism or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so like you're reading this and you think this this might be, you know, what he's getting at, which is kind of boring, right? Because naive, naive yeah. skepticism is boring, um, but it's not that, right? This, this goes through various transformations. Um, so uh, the the book, right? It does begin with a bunch of like little poems, right? Some longer right, than others, yeah. right? Um, I wouldn't uh, like when I was uh, uh, so Joel Parrish was originally going to uh, do the show before a bunch of things came up for him, but um, he uh, he he was saying that he found the poems amusing, but he wouldn't necessarily call it you know great poetry or anything. And I, I sort of agree with that, right? They yeah. are you know they're they're much more uh, they're much better in the service of this book. 
rather than like you know standalone little pieces yeah. but but even a standalone pieces right you could get you know something out of it right just like just just imagine this right the very first is a kind of introduction essentially to the book like so this would be what you would see before you know in the first edition of the text before any prefaces or whatever uh this is how it would start right number one invitation take a chance and try my fare it will grow on you i swear soon it will taste good to you if by then you should want more all the things i've done before will inspire things quite new um so you know j just this kind of idea that i mean it's a kind of like a bit of a clever way to get uh, uh, the idea that um you know it, it, it's kind of like it has a little bit of the walt women quality of you yeah, know like do, do not actually, yeah, yeah do, do, do that's not funny because like yeah do not close your, your doors yeah. to me you know great yeah. libraries or whatever it is like when i originally i actually can see my notes on like i have a couple of actually specifically i read it like um aphorism seven and there's a couple of other ones like i actually have a note saying like it like i remember reading song myself shortly before i read this and it kind of like weirdly reminded me of it despite i feel like most people would say that they you know walt whitman the great demo democratic poet versus Nietzsche, like couldn't be more different but it's um number seven is um learn them someone come after me follow your own self faithfully take time and thus you follow me and that's kind of very much a Whitmanian kind of you know that I stop somewhere waiting for you kind of like mm -hmm. sentiment in that sense I just found like I, I just I like that you said that because it's like very I, I think like they're very obviously very different in terms of their their like specifics or where they're coming from but I do think I think related to what you're saying before about like a lot of like what Nietzsche said being an odds on a surface level with like say for example like left-wing politics or whatever I, I would say what a lot of time I think his conclusions oftentimes tend to be have a, he a hell of a lot of validity to them it's like how we get there that sometimes you see the mm -hmm. datedness or the the stuff that like maybe doesn't hold up as well which I, I think that like that's much better than the other way around where somebody has like a way of getting at things that is right but their conclusions are all bullshit <laughs> you know um mm -hmm. but yeah so I think that that's interesting then that like some of this stuff I, I think that like as poems I would kind of agree with Joel if, if like he was here right now um do you know I would agree with him saying that like as poems in themselves like they're like nothing special but I think like one they would kind of work as little aphorisms in and of themselves but I think like even compared to some of the later aphorisms the fact the rhymes give them a more playful quality it means he can kind of get at things more obliquely or more playfully than he would be able to otherwise and I think like also even just the very concept of having like these like rhymes and songs as he calls them it sort of just goes along just very well with the whole concept of the gay science and like he uses these metaphors of dancing of joyfulness same in Tosh spoke Zarathustra he does it again this sort of and like of convalescence and this sense of joy and like life affirming kind of stuff it kind of just strengthens that concept that he's working with because like it is something that has a, a quality of like being seemingly like superficial or kind of playful or whatever and I think the very fact of like, you know, some of these like the little like rhymes, they have things that in sort of they could work as an aphorism if you used to just state them that way. Mm -hmm. But I think the very fact of doing them as poems, it's it's kind of nearly a kind of deliberate like pushing in the face of anyone say well why aren't you doing this in a systematic way it's like no this is a kind of philosophy that needs to be expressed in these more light-hearted ways. It's like a very like form meeting function style meeting substance kind of like thing which is like, again one of those things that just makes this like makes it sound out as an artistic work as an artistic gambit mm -hmm. in that sense uh number nine is one of my favorites in this little collection uh, called my roses and, and one thing i have to say is uh, you know s specifically to what you said about um you know this whole idea of the gay science the playfulness right when he says gay science right to viewers that might not understand right he's talking about uh, first of all, the science that he's talking about is, uh, you could say, uh, poetry specifically, but more generally, anything that requires a substantial amount of craft and care, right? Yeah. And to it's go about. It's also translated at times as the joyful knowledge. So it's um, der Frühlicher Wissenschaft in German. That's probably a butchered pronunciation, but like, so it's like Wissenschaft is like, it's the word for science, but it's also kind of knowledge or that, like, just that kind of thing in general. Uh, you know it's 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 a knowledge that takes some craft to get to right it's not some sort of yeah. re ready-made cookie cutter type thing but but like also process you know, or, yeah. yeah yeah and also th this playfulness so 
Um, and, and Kaufman, right, uh, his his translations of these, are, I think, are excellent, right? I mean, I haven't read the originals, but they are sufficiently good in English. Um, and it seems like they do get at uh, this, this idea that uh, uh, Nietzsche wants to uh, expose. So anyway, uh, number nine is titled My Roses. Yes, my joy wants to amuse. Every joy wants to amuse. Would you like to pick my roses? You must stoop and stick your noses between thorns and rocky views and not be afraid of bruises. For my joy enjoys good teases. For my joy enjoys good ruses. Would you like to pick my roses? Right? This kind of idea that if you truly do kind of get into Nietzsche um, uh, coming out at the other end, right? There is going, going to be some bruises, right? I mean, again, back to this idea of like the kinds of criticism that he received from, you know, uh, Stephen Pinker types or others. Uh, a lot of it probably is, you know, you, you go through this and you, you really do get a little fucked up and bruised up. And many people just don't know how to deal with it, right? And, and the best way to deal with it, I guess, is to just kind of reject it wholesale, ignore it, uh, say that this is irrelevant, right? He's not worth reading. Um, but, you know, uh, and also the one immediately after uh, called Scorn. There is much I drop and spill. I am full of scorn, you think. If your beaker is too full, there is much you drop and spill without scorning what you drink. Yeah. And it's sort of very, like, I think he kind of develops that. A lot of these poems are like ones he like develops more later on. Like, I feel like the, that, like 10 especially, is like very much in that kind of like life affirming, you know, you're not approaching the outer world out of some desire to fill up your gaps and what you lack, but you're sort of approaching in a sense that you have enough and you're going to approach it and like kind of like take it in and like be like, you know, you're spilling not out of some sense, you know, you, you have enough, you, you can sort of take and leave things for what they are. And like, you know, it's just something I think kind of does crop up in like the preface as well. And that mm -hmm. I think um, one of my like ones that stood out to me actually is like, if we're going to be talking about the artistic event is like um, number 55. He could talk it's a uh, realistic painters. Um, true to nature, all the truth, that's art. This hallowed notion is a treadbare fable. Infinite is nature's smallest part. They paint what happens to delight their heart. And what to lights them, what to paint their able. And like, I yeah. feel like that's like a really great old take on the whole thing of like, you know, people say like art is truth or art is that. And it's like, no, it's like art is inherently yours coming from your own limited point of view and your ability to like take like these little portions of what's in your life and what you perceive and turn it into something. And it's like, mm -hmm. you know, it feels like really like Dan has his like, you know, his usual um little things about like you know art is not truth and translating reality and that so hi dan if you're watching this but um that's where i feel like that's very consonant with that like it's very you know it's that kind of attitude it's like uh, some of his affirmations are, are more limited i feel like but then there are times he sort of he gets at these things in a way that's like very prescient and very like i, I think even beyond some of the like ways art would have been viewed in his time like the sort of like pre-modernist like you know that kind of thing it's it's quite interesting in a way like yeah um i you know there, there's a long kind of history in this kind of you know analysis of uh does art get at it at the truth or the opposite right i mean the uh, probably the most famous example being um you know plato you know very uh, uh distrustful of poets right because uh according to him the poets tell lies now yeah, yeah. uh in you know in, in his own kind of system right uh, maybe there isn't much room for poetry in his kind of like um you know in his, in his state right in his republic uh and that's kind of like the most crass you know maybe ignorant form of uh, artistic critique uh yeah. but then you get you get to nietzsche right who comes to a similar conclusion about um you know the, the that art and poetry or whatever right they don't necessarily express the truth right uh, maybe they get at different elements of truth in an oblique way but it's not the truth uh but to him this is a positive right yes and he actually and this is skipping forward a bit, but like just because it's relevant now. Um, I actually jot this one down. It's like the very ending of book two. He actually has, and we could probably return to this because it does have good, it kind of segues into like play. It kind of uses this, I suppose, as a metaphor, a segue into like a wider view, his wider view of life and how to live it. But like um, he kind of has this 
quote then that like, if we had not welcomed the arts and invited this kind of cult of the untrue, then the realization of general untruth and mendaciousness that now comes to us through science, the realization that delusion and error are conditions of human knowledge and sensation would be utterly unbearable. So um, honesty would lead to nausea and suicide. But now there's a counterforce against our honesty that helps us to avoid such consequences. Art as the good will to appearance. So it's kind of like the view that like, he he kind of then proceeds then to talk about like um as an as aesthetic phenomenon existence is unbearable for us so this is kind of come and like this obviously like has to be placed in context but it's coming about like kind of the conversation about like you know the not like kind of um that he then expands further about like science and about like the fact of our our limited ability to perceive the actual world and how it's all conditional upon our human what you know our human sort of powers of perception and what we're able to do and how limited this is and that but it's kind of like just this sort of aesthetic view of things and this ability I guess to kind of keep these two things in mind at once like it's just it's an interesting view of the arts in and of itself even if it's also been used as a sort of um like a sort of like comparison or a sort of example of something larger so yeah and, and you know to trace that genealogy right i mean so we got plato uh, uh uh you know poetry is false and therefore it's bad um nietzsche uh, poetry is false and therefore it's good yeah. uh and, but then you know if we if we're going to end this with sort of like you know dan schneider's comments about all this uh it, you know i i think it's a very it's a very good uh synthesis in the sense that uh to, to dan schneider it would not be you know good or bad in either case right yeah. it's just you know like a, a factual observation that yeah. you could therefore use uh for the specific kind of you know object of making sure that your art is good right yeah. if you're not so concerned about being truthful you know you could easily get lost for example you know writing a historical novel where the only object in your mind essentially is like i want to make this as realistic and in keeping with you know uh, this or that ancient world right uh as much as i can right you will end up sacrificing art you know for the sake of this other object right you can't you can't have multiple masters like this in in a book right such as that mm -hmm. um and you know to, to dan it would be like well Oh, you know it, uh, it's 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 not you know art is not truth but use that to your advantage to make great yeah. art right and don't moralize about whether or not you know it's it's a, it's a good thing like it's irrelevant the only you know and that like dance common in that sense i think is a uh, you know it, in some ways it's much more you know spiritually nietzsche and even then some of nietzsche's comments about it being innately good right because yeah. of that distinction because uh if, if dan were to say like oh look this is uh essentially we're now in the situation where the only thing that matters is the product that comes at the end yeah. of it right it's an end unto itself like yeah. you know like yeah. it's not like this is like we're going to use this the, like this is the true case when it comes to art and then this is relevant because we can turn it into a like use it to bolster a greater statement about life it's like this is true about art and if you're an artist and if you're doing this that's what matters to you yeah. that is the important part yeah so you know in, in some ways like you know keep this in mind like uh you, you could rehabilitate nietzsche to make him more nietzschean than in fact nietzsche was right yeah. um and i i think that that's also uh, uh, valuable right um it's not you know you can't say it wouldn't be fair to say that he's like a blank slate he's clearly not uh at the same time there hasn't been enough uh um you know uh, kind of like just this kind of like thought about how, how can we rehabilitate this for our own purposes Pe yeah, again like people are just way too fucking scared of you know things that yeah, yeah. things that things that don't matter and that's the thing and nietzsche himself he would be, he, he would be very you know dismissive of, of this like you know why you know why, why are you just being such a coward about this you know um you know in some ways i can imagine him respecting uh a certain strain of left-wing thought Right, that is very kind of ballsy and is very willing to do totally, you know, alien, perhaps even contradictory things, right? In a way that, you know, like very kind of myopic, you know, uh, a silly conservatism uh, is just like very, you know, it's just very scared to do. I was just recently uh, listening to some right wingers talk about, you know, race and economics and shit. And it, like it, everything just seems to me like I, I, whenever I listen to this stuff, it doesn't matter left or right wing, everything is fueled by fear, 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 fear. fear. 
and yeah. a kind of fear and a kind of fear that doesn't goad you to actually do things. It's a kind of fear that forces like you to brain kind of thing. Yeah, it's exactly. Like, it's like the pinker thing again, like, Oh, if I like associate myself in any way with this person, that's bad or whatever, then, mm -hmm. you know, like I'm going to lose clout. I'm going to lose status. And it really doesn't go any deeper than that. Yeah. And in some ways, I mean, there need to be left wingers that positively appraise Nietzsche. Like you got to get, yeah. you know, idiots like Jordan Peterson, you know, totally out of the, the conversation. This is not yeah. for them, right? If this is for the artists, guess what? This is absolutely not for uh, Peterson in that regard. Um, uh, so, I think, yeah. And I think like we can actually maybe move on because I think the whole topic about um, like art and that, that's actually like book two kind of deals a lot with that. And there's actually a few aphorisms that I know with that, like kind of directly like discuss this and that so like i'd say probably we can probably return to like that one if we keep moving through the book because there's definitely a lot to be dealt with like book two is the kind of it's kind of split between it's it's the one about women is the one about art so definitely mm -hmm. a lot to be done there <laughs> well uh, i mean book one begins uh so walter uh, kaufman when he discusses uh, nietzsche right one thing that he's very adamant about is don't just randomly you know uh look through the aphorisms although you could do that especially after reading the book uh, uh you know starting from the, from the beginning as a kind of um you know to the extent that nietzsche has any kind of system you know he does kind of like systematically build up some of these arguments you know it is it is kind of important you know like what is the first set of aphorisms that he you know puts in book one right i mean this sort of sets the tone right so in in book one aphorism one uh in the middle uh, of the first paragraph he says it is easy enough to divide our neighbors quickly with the usual myopia from a mere five paces away into useful and harmful good and evil men but in any large-scale accounting when we reflect on the whole a little longer we become suspicious of this neat division and finally abandon it even the most harmful man may really be the most useful when it comes to the preservation of the species, for he nurtures either in himself or in others through his effects instincts without which humanity would long have become feeble or rotten. Um, and he later says, I no longer know whether you, my dear fellow man and neighbor, are all capable of living in a way that would damage the species. In other words, unreasonably and badly and he often does not he he tends to shy away from the word bad right he prefers good yeah. and evil but his his definition of something like evil is not necessarily our definition like he he does provide different definitions in this book and other books but i think one of the uh, uh one of the definitions that he provides in the gay science specifically is uh he talks about evil as almost like anything that you know comes about out of the past into the present and is powerful enough to start replacing it right it could be you know some you know he, he, in the system right he might even characterize someone like a walt whitman you know as evil in the sense that he takes everything before he totally transforms it everything after walt whitman you know essentially becomes uh, for a while at least a response to walt whitman right ezra pound right for a while right he you know he has all this kind of um you know maybe personal animosity towards whitman and then he has that poem uh something i forget exactly what it is but it's like a short poem about like you know burying the axe or however he phrases it yeah right uh, to to chop wood right uh because maybe he had like whatever resentments about whitman but he recognizes eventually that you know we have to we have to now you know uh, respond to this in the same way that everybody seems to be responding in some way to nietzsche right there's a kind of yeah. evil there this kind of you know this kind of like totally you know we're, we're we're replacing it simply because we can and simply because uh well nietzsche would also say that you know these values are in some way that i'm presenting would be superior right so his notion of evil is not merely he also draws a distinction between you know uh, a master and a tyrant right that's not to say that he's like against yeah. slavery that's another thing i mean he's he's like for slavery and shit like that right um but to him like in a, in a weird way he would be like one of those you know seneca almost type of uh you know slave owners where you know you 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 don't want to be you don't want to be, you know, you could be evil towards uh, your servants, but you shouldn't be bad to them. You know, uh, being bad, you know, denotes like a, a lack of nobility. It denotes yeah. a kind of crassness. It denotes, uh, you know, cruelty 
for the sake of cruelty, not, you know, anything constructive. Whereas yeah. someone that is constructive but evil would say something like, well, you know, I have all these servants around me and they're they're feeding my ability, I don't know, to make great art or whatever it would be. You know, um, you know, Nietzsche yeah. would likely would have, you know, liked uh, servants, you know, for, for that purpose, right? So, um, but anyway, he, he he begins basically the book then essentially by, uh, uh, you know, discussing these notions of of good and evil and 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 yeah. what is actually is useful about them. So anyway, that's I'll stop there. I think like two things, like one, you mentioned like you know what like um, Kaufman's own observations about like you know don't just like look through and pick out random ones you have to look at how it's developed and i do think in, like, in that regard something i know is like it kind of starts the book with like these like much more long kind of you know like these like you like mini essays almost like the aphorisms are like a couple a few pages long and they sort of like the first few ones and they're kind of all like developing these particular arguments and then gradually it segues into these like shorter sometimes at worst more flippant ones but also ones that are sort of giving you these like like just interestingly like, ideas to chew on that sort of all kind of play off each other in ways and I think that that's a very deliberate choice and it's a pretty interesting and effective choice in terms of developing an argument because it's like you do need to provide some context it's like in an artistic sense it's like if you're writing a poem it's like oftentimes you need to give the, the condition the context upon which like your later arguments are lead so it's like oftentimes you know like you kind of give things you kind of met might like open a little bit of description a bit of scene setting that kind of thing and it's like i feel like that's a very like deliberate and precise choice on his part because it's sort of like he's giving the conditions he's offering you but it's like he's also like offering you a much more like sort of coherent and specific and developed argument that you can sort of like you look at it and it's like it is developed out as opposed to these layer aphorisms which they're much more ambiguous and you kind of got to look at the more the context in which they're placed the way they play off what's before and after them and that's so it's it's like it is i think in and of itself you it's what i think it said that is like have it having a lot of impact here but like the second part is like what you mentioned about like where it says, especially, even the most harmful man may really be the most useful when it comes to the preservation of the species. For he nurtures either in himself or in others through his effects, instincts without which humanity would alone become feeble or rotten. So it's like, that kind of interesting enough is something I've seen in some science writing too. There's um, another science writer, someone who's kind of, I'd say, in the mold of Pinker in some in some respects. Uh, Rob, I don't know if you've ever read it, of Robert Sapolsky. I'd say he's like, similar to Pinker, he's a good sci pop, like pop science writer. He actually has a book called behave that sort of goes into in general like human behavior the roots of it he sort of looks at it you know first on the sort of the immediate like neuronal level the hormone level in the days leading up to it the kind of like then looking at you know like conditions in the womb and infanthood and teenagers like basically kind of looking at all like it's a wide scale look and it's quite an interesting book but like one of the points i remember he talks about in it is that like he makes this specific point he makes a distinction between like behavior that is morally good or evil versus pro-social or anti-social behavior and one of the points he makes that i think is quite interesting and like really does like lend to this is that like on a scientific level there's a big difference between things that might be considered morally good according to whatever social standard and again this writer like robert sapolsky i'd say like i said he's quite similar to pinker not just in the sense of being a, like a good pop science stylist and popularizer but he's also like he would himself i'd say admit he's a very much like your sort of good liberal like social liberal type like in the very pinker mold he kind of has but he'll say that like there's like just a difference between this sort of like pro-social behavior in the sense that like for example you have hormones like oxytocin that promote like bond like you know they have the first thing of like bonding with your child or whatever but they also like have a lot to do with i think as well he talks about like kind of like intergroup bonding and promoting this sort of which then has a knock-on effect like us versus them thinking which he then like will use examples of like obviously we all can think of examples where that is a dangerous thing and something where that has led to like damaging effects you know like for example like us versus them when it comes to racial things when it comes to you know nazi germans versus the jews or whatever so it's like but it's at the same time you can't deny it, it is pro-social in the sense that it's promoting social bonds and cohesion within the in-group um but yeah then it's leading even if it's leading to effects that might be considered morally bad in terms of they're othering people they are creating a group upon which is not part of the group and therefore they're bad and different and you know um, I, I, yeah, I just think it's kind of an interesting scientific tangent that relates quite, like, that kind of illustrates what's talking about, like, this behavior in this that, like, 
it, it, it's kind of like it's something that very much is coming from like an, an evolutionary need or an evolution niche within like human human behavior that helps us survive. But like that's kind of very much tangential to whether or not we want to talk it's a good or a bad thing, you know, according to whatever moral code we're like operating under. Yeah. And and I think uh, to, to get into some of the more kind of, um, uh, you know, like, like Nietzsche, like you could sort of uh, describing as somewhat like warlike uh, in his uh, kind of like, you know, commentary. Uh, and I, I think one of the deficiencies in, in Nietzsche is in the fact that uh, he takes this, you know, the, the positives of something like conflict or even, you know, something like war, right? I mean, we could all imagine situations where a war is a positive thing, uh, mm -hmm. net, right? Even if it, you know, takes, uh, uh, you know, a lot of damage to sort of get to the end. Um, he sort of takes that too much at face value, too literally, and in a way that doesn't really draw sufficient distinctions. Like, for instance, um, you know, World War II, uh, I think in retrospect, you could say that uh, as bad as it is, uh, a ton of great positives came out of it, right? Uh, the, yeah. the main one being like we we now have uh, a framework for international law. Now, granted, uh, when it comes to the leading powers in the world, they don't necessarily follow international law, right? America, you know, invades uh, countries uh, both for arbitrary reasons as well as uh, for reasons that you know uh, you violate our kind of like semi-official policy the monroe doctrine right right now we are in the bicentennial right of uh, the monroe doctrine right 1823 to uh, 2023 um uh but at the same time, right, uh, you know, like obviously Russia does the same thing. Uh, China, uh, well, one fascinating thing about China is I would have uh, expected with sort of like my, you know, with my own political sensibilities that at this point, China, because it's sufficiently powerful enough, I would have expected that a country of that size and that power relative to the rest of the world at this point to have uh, uh, wrecked a lot of havoc in the world. And thus far, they haven't really, right? I mean, you could say, you know, there's like repression and, uh, um, you know, very sparse in China. We could talk about, you know, uh, uh, you know, accusations of, of genocide and stuff like that, uh, of Uyghurs and, and whatever. Um, but still, comparatively speaking, that's, that's far less uh, then, for instance, like something like the the slaughter of Native Americans, right? Um, yeah. You know, they're, they're they're sort of like you know, and, and also like you know, they have like a kind of like you know, you could sort of say quasi slave uh, labor system kind of thing going on, especially historically with the Lao guy. But still, it's not the same thing as you know slavery in 1850 in America, right? It's not the same yeah. thing as slavery in the Caribbean. So I, I would have expected, you know, China at this point to have released a lot more carnage in the world. And, you know, it's it's uh, uh, it's interesting to see what's going to happen in the next few decades, whether or not they're going to go down the route that pretty much every great power eventually goes down on. But anyway, we could say, you know, uh, you know, essentially that, look, uh, some good things can't come out of war. Right. Uh, we have an international system of law that for the most part, even if it gets broken here and there. There's a lot less physical violence today in terms of like war deaths or whatever compared to years yeah. and years ago. You know, like even something like the Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, when I did that conversation with uh, Professor Ivan Kachanovsky, one thing that he contends that I'm not sure if this is true or not, um, but he contends that the total casualties uh, in Russia-Ukraine, including civilian deaths, is like only something like, I don't know maybe 30,000 or maybe a bit more or whatever altogether, which is just like, it's just shockingly low compared to like what we know historically about how wars tend to be, especially with such a massive power, you know, invading a much smaller one. Um, but anyway, so like, we, you know, uh, we have good things to happen out of war. However, I think the deficiency in Nietzsche is that he wouldn't draw the appropriate kind of distinctions. Like one of the problems now uh, in something, for instance, like Russia, Ukraine is uh, Russia is simply you know, uh, uh, right now it is invoking the same thing that America invokes, which is the Monroe Doctrine, right? They're saying if you have a Monroe Doctrine in your, uh, uh, you know, yeah. territory, we're going to have a Monroe Doctrine in our backyard, right? But nobody is actually really thinking about like, well, you know, we've we've had this Monroe Doctrine now for 200 years and we had like de facto Monroe Doctrines or whatever for a while yet and other countries more or less, you know, sphere of influence, you know, great power politics or whatever. But nobody's really talking about, well, how do we get beyond 
you know, Monroe Doctrine politics, right? At this, like, if the, if this war does not lead to these kinds of reappraisals, where America's like, you know what? The fact that we've been violating international law ever since the collapse of the USSR has made Putin's invasion uh, more likely than it otherwise would have been if we would have like upheld standards of the law. Like nobody's doing that reappraisal. Like nobody's talking about that at all. At all, right? There is no there. You know. So in that way, this is a war that would not might not necessarily lead to uh, truly positive outcomes, right? Yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, another example is uh, uh, I, I remember like this this guy Stephen Kotkin who who writes on on Russia. And I remember in 2017, early 2017, he had this lecture uh, on the Trump administration, and he said something like, um, you know, for all the problems that it seems to be that we're going to have with this administration, uh, the one thing that he could say so far that's going to be positive about just the existence of somebody like Trump and the fact that he won the election isn't the fact that there's now a group of people in middle America, right? These are the millions by which that Trump won his election. If he had not won the 2016 election, we would have continued to pretend that these people don't exist, right? Mm. Which is true, but at the same time, I wonder to what extent people acknowledge now that they exist. I mean, it doesn't yeah. seem to me that Biden has really done anything substantively that would get those people like thinking differently about Democrats. I mean, with all the promises Democrats made and with how little they in fact delivered, uh, if anything, maybe we're just like radicalizing those people further and further. So I think like as from an outside perspective, like I think if anything, the whole like Trump debacle has kind of led to the same people that previous would have known him now feel justified in ignoring them because they mm -hmm. can go like, oh, well, they're just like a bunch of bigots. We're not just we're going to ignore them, but like feel vaguely guilty the way you do when you walk past a homeless person on the street and try to mm -hmm. not make eye contact with them. But we're going to ignore them. We're going to go like, fuck, yeah, we do. They deserve to be ignored. They have bad opinions. They're bigots. They hate us. We're going to now go out of our way to ignore them. And I mean, honestly, in some way, it's probably more fucking dangerous. Like, so, yeah, yeah I mean, I, it's, I would it's, it's, it's going on right time. now. Yeah, it, it's going on right now with something like COVID. COVID, right. I mean, uh, right now, yeah. the, the approach to COVID as well, you know, fuck you. If you didn't get vaccinated, you know, it's on you. It's your fault. Yeah. Nobody's like willing to really examine, you know, the sort of structural yeah. processes yeah. in place. Why some like, especially among, you know, like liberals, you know, sensibly, they're very sort of, you know, sympathetic to, you know, the plight of black, black America. Well, black America is especially, you know, resistant to uh, getting vaccinated, depending mm -hmm. on where you, where you look, which is why, you know, you know, at least in New York City, you know, uh, so many uh, black uh, 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 black residents are the ones that are still masking, right? Because maybe you know they're not vaccinated, but they still take it more seriously in a kind of like day to day yeah. way than you do. Um, so you know that's already going on. They are ignoring you know middle America. So anyway, the, the point here in relation to Nietzsche is uh, he, you know, there is such a thing as uh, a war and conflict at a time when there's this kind of extreme stagnation that doesn't actually break out of the stagnation it's bloodshed uh, essentially for the sake of bloodshed it's bloodshed for the sake of you know great power yeah. politics uh it's ignoring people you know due to resentments uh, it's you know there's you know corpses to pile up due to that but um, you, you can't have this kind of blanket approach to war in a way that, you know, maybe it's not totally fair to say about Nietzsche, but he also does not necessarily do himself too many favors yeah, by not really by not making these distinctions. Yeah. Yeah. Counter arguments. And I think like maybe like two kind of thoughts about that is like one, I wonder if like to some degree there is like an element of him taking this like kind of conceit or this kind of idea of like suffering potentially being a good thing and like sort of inflating it from an individual level up until up into this wide scale level without maybe fully kind of playing through the consequences of it but like also i wonder if maybe if it's a degree of i i guess this might sound a bit of an unfair term to use but maybe a bit of provincialism or whatever that like to be honest like anyone is going to face when they're being looked at 150 years later after the time of their writing you know like like there's definitely going to be like say people are looking at this video like 150 years ago i'm sure there's like they could apply the term provincial to some things that we're not even going to be aware of how they would apply that that's yeah. the point so it's like like to be honest like there's a sense which like modern geopolitics is kind of probably a bit beyond the ken of even someone like Nietzsche that like do is quite prescient and relevant nowadays in a social sense but like I, I don't I don't know how much like the social context of like 
of 19th century Germany would have prepared somebody for like the way geopolitics would have developed nowadays and the implications of that. So maybe it is a bit of that like sort of limitations or provincialism and stuff. Yeah, and, and whenever he does ever get, you know, a little specific about uh, maybe some of his like political beliefs in terms of like contemporary events, like I always find it very sort of like touching and precious uh how <laughs> yeah. like, like like it's it's very touching and precious how like he was so disturbed by the paris commune you know like he was just like so many of his own kind of like philosophical perspectives what he understands about the world what he fears about the world he thought the paris commune was like a manifestation of all this stuff you know coming up right yeah. in, in retrospect like it is very precious and silly but you know at the same time um you know like you said, like, we're all going to fall into that shit at the same yeah, yeah. like as well like it's kind of inescapable so it's just it is what it is yeah um all right so we we covered uh uh um aphorism number one out of 400 <laughs> and we're an hour into uh or whatever it is into this talk so hey. let's maybe um, uh I'll see if this, move yeah, up a little bit yeah uh, well, 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 let me just say a little bit because I mean, aphorism number one, like by getting through it, you get through a lot of other stuff that you don't have to necessarily touch upon. So yeah. uh, later on, he says something like, uh, from time to time, this instinct, which is at work equally in the highest and the basest men, the instinct for the preservation of the species erupts as reason and as passion of the spirit. Then it is surrounded by a resplendent retinue of reasons and tries with all the force at its command to make us forget that at bottom it is instinct, drive, folly, lack of reasons. Life shall be loved because man shall advance himself and his neighbor because what names all these shalls and becauses receive and may yet receive in the future. Right. And I mean, we, we sort of see that now, right? We, we're getting so many, you know, uh, uh, shalls and becauses. And, you know, if anything, like uh, uh, to sort of like, you know, draw distinctions between left and right wing, you know, interpretations of Nietzsche, um, you know, th this touches just as much upon the kind of, you know, right wing and more kind of reactionary perspectives of, you know, what the shall and the because would look like. Right. Um, yeah. You know, you, you, you could critique it from that same sort of from that same sort of direction. Yeah. And it's kind of just like, I feel like, yeah, this does set up a lot of the things that are like looked at again later. And it's just like one of the big things like here and it is just like, why do we do this? And it's just sort of, I, I think like he ends up the most like a lot of it is just post hoc rationalizations. That don't really get at the core of why we would even be interested in coming up with it's not even look well why are these even issues to begin with why are why is everyone so concerned about why why life shall be loved or why man shall invite him his neighbor so like I, yeah it's kind of is setting up that like big concern mm -hmm. and i think like it is just sort of I, I think it kind of does bring up as well the um let's see it kind of brings up as well actually in this section like later they're the kind of the introduction because he has like a bunch of these little motifs that are brought up again and again which which is also something that like looking at some like later writers that were in by him like Hermes or something like that like it's definitely well, if you have like the idea of laughter is something he kind of like like is clearly like very Nietzschean and it's kind of a, a, his attempt at developing this idea so you have here like some quotes like um um, in order that what happens necessary and always spontaneously and without any purpose may henceforth appear to be done for some purpose and strike man as rational and ultimate commandments, the ethical teacher comes on stage as the teacher of the purpose of existence. And to this end, he invites, invents a second different existence and unhinges the means of his new mechanics, the old ordinary existence. Indeed, he wants to make sure that we do not laugh at existence or at ourselves. And then later, he kind of, yeah, he kind of brings this up then later. So he's kind of using laughter, I guess. It goes on concept of the gay science, like this this, this whole concept of just having a sense of levity towards life and a sense of kind of just embracing the irrationality of it. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, not only laughter but, and gay wisdom, but the tragic too, with all its sublime unreason, belongs among the means and necessities of the preservation of the species. So yeah, it's kind of um, it's just one of those motifs that then crops up later and kind of is done a few times. So yeah, there is a fair amount of weight being carried by this. And I think, like I said, like I think the fact of having these longer, more developed arguments is like carrying a lot of weight then in some of the like ones that later on might come off as a bit more flippant or tossed off because mm -hmm. they're giving it something to play off against. 
Uh, and I mean, uh, um, aphorism number 20 touches on, on this idea uh, again, right? The dignity of folly, where he says, mm. a few millennia further along in the road of the last century, and everything men do will exhibit the highest prudence. But that way, prudence will lose all of its dignity. By then, it will be necessary to be prudent, but it will also be so common and vulgar that a disgusted taste will experience this necessity as a vulgarity. And just as a tyranny of truth and science could increase esteem for the lie, a tyranny of prudence could spur the growth of a new kind of nobility. To be noble might then come to mean to entertain follies. So just to kind yeah. of like uh, like be specific about what he means, the, the tyranny of truth and science. I mean, uh, may I don't think there was this term back then, but scientism, right, is a term yeah. that is around today. There's, you know, so many things that science cannot answer. It's just not in the realm of yeah. science to talk about things like values and, and meaning for the most part. Now, I think there could be something in the future. Uh, I'd be very interested to see what develops in terms of like objectifying actual values. But so far, I don't think there have been too many successful yeah. uh, attempts at that. But uh, anyway, uh, so uh, science often, I think kind of like maybe uh, out of a sense of its own, it could be both out of a sense of its own strengths but also a kind of maybe like nagging perception of its own uh limitations right i mean so many scientists probably you know want to be artists i mean so many great you notice how many great scientists have been spurred onto some of their discoveries because like i read this great book right and it was so wonderful and poetic and it really stuck with me and it goaded me into you know discovering x y and z right that happens all yeah. the time right so there might be also this kind of sensation among scientists that uh you know, there are things that as powerful as you might feel are totally outside of your purview and they will never be yeah. in your purview, right? So he's kind of <clears throat> responding to, to this idea of scientism, right? And uh, I, I think there's something to the idea that uh, uh, in the future, right, in terms of like like prudence, like there, there's, there's so many people in the world, right? Because everything in the world has been very much systematized in a way that's kind of counter to, to Nietzsche and just counter to like uh, maybe people of, of that type that um uh you know there's so many people they have like if you ask them like do you have a single opinion that is controversial that could potentially get you in trouble if somebody finds out and there are, there are definitely people in the world that they would answer no i have no opinions yeah. that could get me into any kind of trouble and right proud of this. Yeah. and they they could be proud of it they could s s sense like well there's nothing wrong with that you know like um but you know in the future like if things do become you know and it's not homogenization of like the law like it, it's not that the law necessarily is compelling you right it's more just kind of like social pressures right it's a lot easier to sort of like you know whip people into into shape or whatever right there's kind of a less room for this kind of dissent um i think by you know and, and we're kind of starting to see this now right uh and i wouldn't necessarily call this like a nobility of spirit but if you have this kind of extreme reaction among uh, certain kinds of right wingers to like narratives of truth, you know, you could have something to the Capitol riots, right? Where it's like, well, you know, you know, th th this election was totally false, right? This election was totally fraudulent, so we need to have a riot about this, right? In in a way that's kind of like, um, and, and people make the conversation, let's say, only about that, right? They're like, oh, isn't it so crazy that we could have a, such a large group of people that truly believe that we had a fraudulent election and they really will take this to the grave? Uh, but to me, that that's not the interesting part of the conversation. The interesting part of that conversation resides in the fact that you have so many problems in American democracy that you could even, you know, make a kind of argument that you know, we have a kind There's of maybe room for such a notion to grow and to to gain, like, kind of work up so much steam among such a gr big group of people says something yeah, about the country. Yeah, I mean, because because like in many respects, don't we have a kind of like ersatz kind of democracy, right? In the sense that, yeah. um, you know, uh, it, it's true that uh, it, the, the, the votes that were counted in 2020 were the votes that, uh, you know, got Biden into office, right? He won that election, you know, by virtue of the fact that more people voted for Biden, you know, end of story. At the same time, I remember when I was watching the debates, right? And I forget which one it was. Maybe it was the first one or the second one. 
And Trump was like really like going in on Biden, just kind of like, you know, like very angry and loud and accusing him of things. And Biden was kind of, he was kind of like nervous. And he was kind of like, you know, reactive. And I remember just watching that and realizing these are like two old white men that have never given a shit about anything. One is a lifelong corrupt businessman. The other one is a lifelong corrupt politician. And they're so old and they're so stupid and they're so useless. Isn't it insane that these are the two people that they're saying we need to vote for? You have one choice or the other. That's not a fucking choice. That's not a real democracy. I understand that it's a democratic process that ultimately got them there. But there's so many undemocratic elements to this process yeah, it's like that would, coming up that, would make, like, it's, that would make those two uh, outcomes inevitable. That and 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 to me, mm -hmm. like that's ultimately the thing. Like you know, like there, there's a crude response to this, a kind of crass capital riots, like you didn't actually win the yeah. election. But the more kind of subtle response, like basically what I'm talking about. Th that's true, right? You ha you have yeah. a reason to be skeptical of American democracy and these outcomes if these are your two fucking choices. Yeah. And that's and the thing. And, and 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 nobody would actually none of the two people voting, none of the people voting for one or the other would actually accept that framing, right? That's the problem. Yeah, and it's like the what you said, like to bring it back to the whole like idea of scientism and like the cult of like rationality or logic. And then in like its crudest form, it's sort of like like you you remember obviously the whole like online thing is like you still get a bit online of like a lot of these people that would like make their whole identity about being atheists or whatever and they'd be sort of like oftentimes you'd be people who'd make make it their identity oh i'm rational i i you know i mm -hmm. i don't you know you know the and then it kind of grew into i think that's what mutated in the whole like ben shapiro thing and it's sort of like um feels aren't reals and like all these like dumb fucking means like that's always a crude example of it but it's sort of like i do think it has some like resemblance or some like bearings to like how stuff like that is able to happen because it's sort of like the idea is like logic above when people talk about logic or whatever well it's like you can logic is just a process like democracy as you said it's a process and it's like that process can be happening upon completely fallacious foundations so it's like like you said you can have this democratic process that is occurring on a foundation that is like really not democratic it's corrupt it's this and that and it's like the same way you can have a, a completely log you can have statements that, well this is entirely logical like you see this a lot with some of these like a lot of these online sort of like more right-wing adjacent kind of communities they will talk and they will downright fetishize logic and they will place themselves in opposition to the sjw types to do this but it's like it's all about the process and it's all about glorifying this process of logicality with no consideration as to the foundations upon which these logical things the premises upon which this logic is founded so yeah um, it's, which is, I think it's really like the sin, the same, which I'm kind of just thinking now talking about this. It's really like, it's an example of this sort of like, it's privileging of the image and of the like surface level ability to have these processes and to say, well, look, we're doing it right, but no consideration towards the deeper, the actual substance of it. And I think as well, just to finish off and bring it back to this, actually, quote from aphorism too that sort of like illustrates what like you were just talking about and kind of there is, hold on, the great majority of people does not consider it contemptible to believe this or that or to live accordingly without first having given themselves an account of the final and most certain reason pro or con and without even troubling themselves about such reasons afterwards so it's kind of mm -hmm. just coming back to that it's sort of like you you end up believing there's this or that and there's no actual like not much talk given to the foundation beneath it which then sort of segues into a lot of like his critiques about like moral thought and the implications and the ignored implications of all that uh, I mean, speaking of moral thought, uh, the next thing that I have written down on uh, aphorism 27, um, this is a kind of interesting way to think about uh, religion and the sort of kind of ascetic uh, uh, qualities that, that you know, people try to undertake. I remember like one time Dan Schneider, I forget which book it was, but um, he, he uh, I forget who he was talking about specifically, but uh, he was talking about like asceticism, especially things like, you know, asceticism when it comes to food or, you know, sex as being like just totally like a fucking like perversion, right? Like you're you like the like the 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 kind of like sexual ascetics, right? They are the actual perverts, right? Like this thing that is totally normal. Right, this thing that is uh, uh, to uh, totally healthy. Granted, you could, you know, you could have sex, you could eat food or whatever in totally unhealthy ways. This is true, but generally speaking, you know, the thing itself is not the problem. And yet, right, you could have mm -hmm. all these ascetics that, by you know, denying these very basic features of themselves, they're actually, you know, the true perverts in a kind of twisted way. 
Um, yeah. you know, the converse essentially of like some of someone that, you know, spends their entire life, I don't know, in the swinger lifestyle or whatever. And just like, this is, this yeah, they're is their still obsession. facing a massive part of their life and their energy. Let's be real on avoiding that very thing. They're still making the thing, the center part of their, the like sort of centerpiece of their lifestyle, because it's, yeah. it's like, it's, it's much harder to just go your whole life deliberately avoiding all the situations in which you could possibly get embroiled in like some sort of you know be tempted to have sex or whatever and be resisting this thing than it is to just just live a normal life and let these things play out as they will and just accept it or whatever you know yeah like, you know asceticism is a kind of like virtue signal that's just the converse mm -hmm. of like what, what today you know are called maybe like sex nerds you know um <laughs> yeah. we're, we're just like it's just such a it's like, the same I, kind I, of people too it's the same kind of people yeah, like, like, like the same like ultimate personalities. Yeah, that you yeah, see. yeah. Like the same nerdy yeah. kind of like, like it's it's you look at like the incel types and like they have this need to sort of classify and and like sort of categorize everything in exactly the same way as like the sex nerd types do. Um. Yeah. Like it reminds me of how like uh, recently um uh, I saw this uh, tweet by this uh, uh I don't know how to pronounce her name Ayala. She's like I guess like the number one OnlyFans. <laughs> uh you know like whatever like sex Creator, worker yeah um and anyway related to the whole sex nerd thing um because recently she appeared in some other tweet where like brett weinstein and heather weinstein were like talking shit about her uh in terms of like why is she out there you know like i think like, producing this content and you're know, talking about sexuality in a way where just totally upends our own understandings of, of sex and sexuality and in, in some of the and grant like what they were saying was totally st stupid and unwarranted but then somebody to defend her showed up in the tweets and it was started talking about this. It was this very weird direction that made me think like, this is such a kind of like virtue signaling sex nerd when she was like, this reminds me so much of like the couples looking for unicorns. And what that means is it's a male, female couple yeah. that is looking for um, uh, a women to like, you know, single women to fuck or whatever. Uh, and she was like, this reminds me of like the couples looking for unicorns that, you know, you, you know, you come up to them and you try to like gauge their small talk to see whether or not you want to hook up with them. And you see right away that it's everything is a, is a red flag. And it's like, why would you even like bring up this totally unwarranted comment about your own sex life just to express yeah. the fact that you're a fucking sex nerd? You know, it's just like, anyway, so and like so, this is yeah. exactly like they're the like useful idiots that then just yeah. end up proving the point, the conservatives, because they just turn around like, look at these perverts, they're unable to keep sex out of anything for two minutes and make a critique. And it's just like, they're like, oh, yeah, no it's not whatsoever. even a good comparison. Like, it's not even like a particularly good or like, insightful metaphor comparison yeah yeah, yeah yeah it's a terrible comparison because it's like you watch heather weinstein and brett weinstein and they're such fucking squares there's zero chance exactly that they have ever looked for a girl to like hook up with zero chance there's no way that they're doing <laughs> shit like that there's there's no way that there's yeah. such fucking squares <laughs> yeah. the point is look a small number of people can do what you're doing ayla and if they do i'm not saying it will make civilization non-viable but you are playing with the stuff that does run that risk you're not the only one playing with the only set of things that put it at risk but this is one of the things that puts it at risk and so in any case think about whether or not the people who are reacting to you are not just having a hissy fit but in fact are trying to explain something that isn't easily explained which is when you do what you're doing, it becomes impossible for civilization to function in any way that it has ever functioned before. And and like to, to and to not see that, uh, but to just like write your own narrative. So anyway, uh, just yeah, it's kind it. of like actually just to say it's like very like in a way kind of narcissistic or something. It's like you're unable to sort of like look at and criticize people for what they are. You know, mm -hmm. even if like saying what they, even if you're saying what they are is something shit, it's like at least if you're dealing them on their own terms, like mm -hmm. uh, that for But there's one I made a note of just because it sort of stood out to me as being a little. It was it's both quite well written and like and well structured, but it's also quite in terms of it's a number sixteen over the footbridge. Mm -hmm. Um, so like this is a bit of a digression. Oh from yeah, what we're I, talking I, about, yeah, but it's like I, 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 I was wondering if I should discuss it, but I was like, in what way would I discuss it? But yeah, no, no, I, I want to bring it up because like it stood out to me. I have it marked from the first time I read it, and this time it's just like it stood out to me how unusual it is in general. I just want to see any thoughts on how it might relate to this. So I'll just read it anyways because it's a, I think it's like a really like it's a well written and well structured little piece of writing. So 
In our relations with people who are bashful about their feelings, we must be capable of dissimulation. They feel a certain hate, sudden hatred against every, anyone who catches them in a tender, enthusiastic or elevated feeling as if he had seen their secrets. If you want to make them feel good at such moments, you have to make them laugh or voice some cold but witty sarcasm. Then their feeling freezes and they regain power over themselves. But I'm giving you the moral before telling the story. There was a time in our lives when we were so close that nothing seemed to obstruct our friendship and brotherhood and only a small footbridge separated us. Just as you were about to step on it, I asked you, do you want to cross the footbridge to me? Immediately, you did not want to say any more. And when I asked you again, you remained silent. Since then, mountains and torrential rivers and whatever separates and alienates separates and alienates have been cast between us and even if we wanted to get together we couldn't but when you now think of that little footbridge footbridge words fail you and you sob and marvel yeah and he yeah. comes just totally just, you know out of nowhere you yeah. know that's the thing it, it's exactly not, it's, yeah it's, it's not logical from 15 or from 17 that this would be sandwiched in between but yeah exactly i agree um, i just think it's really well written as well because the whole like idea of like but i'm giving you the moral before telling the story it's like one of those things i'm like re i was rewritten and like damn like i would love to kind of like i just want to like note that little like kind of structural trick down like mm -hmm. maybe for a poem or something because the whole concept yeah. of doing like it's kind of like you kind of give this like more like kind of general like cool more detached like like kind of um general description of a human tendency and then you turn it into a personal thing and just kind of mm. like leave you to sit with it it's just very effective and very well in itself it's, it is an interesting little enigma and it is a sort of as well it's a, like a particular like emotional insight or whatever that is true like you can sort of read into it and sort of think of it it does like think of your own kind of like encounters or things that have happened it's interesting yeah because you know with the exception of some of the you know stuff in the preface about his convalescence and whatnot um, you know, it is kind of like emotionally closed off in terms of Nietzsche's own uh, uh, feelings. But here, you know, you could just imagine there is like a friend, right? Or perhaps mm -hmm. there is a, a, you know, he was like in, in love with that woman, for instance, that did not want to marry him. Who, or you perhaps know, who, it's like something where he himself has like... Or to, or to his sister. Or to his sister, possibly, yeah. But the, as well, the fact that ends, but when you now think of that little footbridge, words fail you and you saw marvel like it's a lot of i find that interesting because it's like making this a grand assumption on the part of the person he's grown away from and it's like it could even be a sort of a self-indictment like it could be like well this was me who didn't do this and that could explain mm -hmm. this sort of insight into a person who's described as being far away you know like i think it's like it is interesting in that sense especially because he seems to have been like somewhat of an introverted person who sort of did have his own falling away from like certain friends or whatever and yeah, it, it it is it is interesting and it's very it is kind of resonant and relatable on both sides of it. In, in terms of, of those imbuements, right? Uh, just to reread the final sentence. But when you now think of that little footbridge, words fail you and you sob and marvel. Uh, it is very much Nietzschean in the sense that you know he th the word that he chooses to end everything uh, here with is marvel, right? It's this kind of you know transcendental. Yeah. It's not it's not just yeah. the you know it's, it's not just the sobbing of the emotions. It's also the recognition that hey look there is now this distance there are now these problems right there's yeah. there's you know there's a kind of nietzschean recognition there that's interesting uh and it could know. be it could be like that you marvel and it is well it's sort of ambiguous in the sense it could be marveling that even such a footbridge is possible or something like that you know mm -hmm. like that that even the possibility you know like there is i just feel like that's one, one of the reasons it works like there are kind of ambiguities there and i think like it's nearly the sort of back to front structure of it that makes that work so fucking well and it's just a very good like artistic little touch there uh so the the uh, um the whole uh, uh heather and brett weinstein thing the ala thing um uh i i was discussing it to specifically lead into aphorism number uh, 27 the man of renunciation right in terms of this kind of like virtue signals and really maybe what's what's behind i mean because if you think about like what is a virtue signal right it is a, a means of just sort of getting above someone else right it's not you know there's nothing selfless about it right so this is an interesting way to, to view uh some of these dynamics so the man of renunciation what does the man of renunciation do he strives for a higher world he wants to fly further and higher than all men of affirmation he throws away much that would encumber his flight, including not a little that he esteems and likes. He sacrifices it to his desire for the heights. This sacrificing, this throwing away, however, is precisely what alone becomes visible and leads people to call him the man of renunciation. 
It is as such that he confronts us, shrouded in his hood, as if he were the soul of a hair shirt. But he is quite satisfied with the impression he makes on us. He wants to conceal from us his desire, his pride, his intention to soar beyond us. Yes, he is cleverer than we thought and so polite to us, this man of affirmation. For that is what he is, no less than we, even in his renunciation. I just think that's a re it's I, I do think it's an interesting aphorism because it has that a bit of ambiguity like I feel you could sort of take it as being either a critique maybe of the man of renunciation or you could take it as sort of uh not exactly a praising but it's sort of like sort of affirming or sort of raising these more subtleties behind such an attitude I, I don't know I do think it's one of those ones that carries a bit of ambiguity with it because mm -hmm. you can sort of say well you know like the idea of him so um i just kind of say it's, it's interesting because you can take it both ways like it's um like we we're saying earlier like it's it is an one of the aphorisms you can sort of repurpose so it's you could see it as like you could sort of see it as an idea like a sort of a reappraisal and a sort of giving credit to this concept of like this like hypothetical man of renunciation because the idea that he's the prioritizing and what he's like leaving behind or what he's leaving is only something that's coming from an outside perspective doesn't quite understand so you could see that in terms of maybe say an artist or i know um even some of these like his like various historical figures have made sacrifices or whatever or you know so on who like kind of they're looking outside in terms of what is being lost or what they're like putting aside as as opposed to what they're gaining from it or you could sort of but it also kind of contains in it a little bit of a okay so you have the it is such that he confronts us shrouded in it but, but he is quite satisfied with the impression that he makes us he wants to conceal from us his desire so it's a sort of i think it ends up being like interesting and that's a bit of an indictment on the part of the man of renunciation himself wanting to present this in some way or wanting to kind of give this attitude of humility but on the other hand also the people looking from beyond like he, he says we but it's kind of like again it's ambiguous it's like is he trying to is Nietzsche like aligning himself or praising this way of viewing or is he doing it in sort of an ironical way like the mass is looking at a, a particular like exceptional or interesting person that is doing this for a higher purpose I have a, a I have a aphorism uh, 54 which is uh, interesting and it's also it's a little bit obscure but it's also something that, you know, if you, if you can't even fully yeah. understand the meaning, I can imagine this I being that used. I that one too, yeah. Yeah, it, I can imagine this being used, you know, artistically, right, for some other kind of purpose. So I mean, what I take away from it is this idea that uh, on some level, you know, uh, with sufficient appearance, right, appearance versus, versus reality ceases as a distinction to become a point. In fact, I mean, he sort of says this yeah. more explicitly down the road, yeah, something yeah. along the lines of that, you know, appearance eventually with enough appearance and perception, it starts to change the shape of the object being perceived. Yeah, it becomes, it tries I think there's to, one, it's, it's like, so I can't remember the number, but something like when some, it, it, what something is called or how it is referred to, how it's viewed is like, it's always more important than what it is because with time and, you know, like that kind of becomes an inherent part of what, of an essence of what the thing is. So the whole appearance, essence, distinction, he kind of mm -hmm. returns that. But yeah, it's just a really beautiful piece of writing. And I feel like it's kind of, it is a little bit, it is quite more poetic or it is quite um, oblique or whatever in some sense. But like, I do think it's kind of, um, it also like, I, I, it's an idea that he kind of comes back to or he talks about more explicitly in terms of just, I guess, his view on metaphysics. I like, there is no metaphysics or it's just, or even like, there's no, but it's like, why is this even something we're bothering with? It's kind of mm -hmm. like, why is this such a topic of concern throughout the history of philosophy? Mm -hmm. Why is this something that is given so much time and so on? And I think like the whole, like it just suddenly woke up. It's just in some ways it's referring to, I guess, or, or I kind of take it. I, I kind of think reading it, it's referring to just the process of writing this book or the process of coming across these kinds of ideas and of realizing, or maybe of this gay science that, you know, this is the waking up, but like, it's just merely waking up to realize that it's all a dream and to sort of, you know, continuing doing it, but like, that's all the knowledge you can gain. It's not some knowledge beyond the dream, it's the knowledge that this is a dream. And then how do you continue? And like, what do, would it mean to continue participating in this with this knowledge? Mm -hmm. so, but it is, yeah, really beautiful piece of writing. Mm -hmm. It's it's kind of as well, like very like evocative of the whole concept of like that again, like you'd later see in Freud and that of the unconsciousness, you know, like the unconscious of that, you know, like it's this whole we have these drives and these urges that are sort of below conscious recognition. 
and that mm-hmm. these are kind of just playing out in these things and that, you know, it's it, it's just, in, it's yeah, it's really interesting piece of writing. I have uh, just, the, I kind of just noted the last um, piece because okay. I feel like the endings to the books, the last aphorism 56, I think the endings to the books are generally like very just well done, like as endings, mm-hmm. like they generally work well. They have a certain, like they work as a good like little segue and summing up and they kind of, they, they just have, they you know, it's they don't fall flat. They're interesting. I kind of think of uh, this one as being quite interesting. We're like talking more about like the political kind of, how you might relate this to and especially modern day politics and virtue signaling of that so um uh these young people demand that not happiness but unhappiness should approach from the outside and become visible and their imagination is busy in advance to turn it into a monster so that afterward they can fight a monster if these people who crave distress felt the strength inside themselves to benefit themselves and to do something for themselves internally then they would also know how to create for themselves internally their very own authentic distress so yeah i, I think that like you could sort of like i i think, I think that kind of works well uh, in some ways as a critique of maybe you know like I guess we're saying some of these virtue signaling, some of these kind of like conjuring or any like, you know, beyond like a lot of politics, like, I mean, it works in terms of not just oh owning the libs or whatever, but like on the other side, like any kind of group of people that's conjuring up these boogeymen and something as something to finance, maybe as a way of ignoring deeper problems or even on an individual terms, like we all know, like people who, you know, will constantly project onto others that they, you know, like, or like in relationships or whatever, they'll always like find a way to sort of make their problems seem as if they're coming from others and maybe ignore the ways in which they themselves are genuinely struggling. And like, you know, their problems are coming from more internal sources. Like it's something that works on multiple levels. And it's a very, I know it works as both a social and a psychological insight. And it also works in terms, cause it like segues very well into like, you have this end bit, um, they do not know what to do with themselves and therefore paint the distress of others on the wall. They always need others and continually other others. Pardon me, my friends. I ventured to paint my happiness on the wall. So interesting ending also kind of gets back to that like sense of, I guess, deficiency or that sense of just using these outer things or using others as a way to sort of gratify this need for like like this need for struggle or this need of something to struggle against or struggle for or whatever rather than like letting this derive from any sort of genuine authentic distress as he calls it and yeah it, it's just kind of there's a few different interpretations and i do think that it's just pretty cogent like it's it just it just does really work like it's in that sense like it's kind of it works it kind of as well relates i think to a lot of what he talks about pity and so on too that like pity oftentimes when people pity others it's a way of like you gain some sort of you you can only pity others from a stance of superiority which like Mm -hmm. is kind of like a lot of his arguments that come from so it's sort of like you're in a sense like you're using the distress of others you're using others either as an enemy or as a sort of like you know like something you can fight for and it's all coming back to like your own needs and that rather than anything else so like it's kind of i i you know i think it works pretty well in that present ending because it like kind of like kind of gets at certain things that are being talked about earlier but also like introduces certain themes that are going to be developed more so yeah yeah i mean in in, in, in terms of endings uh I, I don't know if i have this uh aphorism written down to discuss but there is some aphorism uh, some section in the book where he says something like, uh, so many artists, right, or people in general, they don't know how to end, right? They have yeah, a problem. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah they, they have a problem with uh, uh, like coming to a graceful sort of end, whether it's conversation, whether it's a book, whether it's a poem, right? I would add to that also, you know, beginnings, um, right? The, the whole kind of like trick of you go to a bookstore, you look at the uh, uh, opening uh, of each chapter and the ending of each chapter, yeah. right? To see whether or not it's worth reading. Because, you know, if you're an artist of sufficient quality, there's no way that you could have like shit starts and shit ends in like a fantastic middle, you know? Um, mm. gr- well, there might be like a very like edge case, but generally speaking, when you're just looking for things worth your attention, right uh cu- cu- cutting out the uh, beginning cutting out the end and just having the middle will probably not be a, a book worth your time so um you know he's he's come to that conclusion uh, as well uh, even even before us you know a lot again a lot of things are a kind of uh, response uh, to nietzsche and after this i have the whole kind of like section in book two that he has about uh, women that's kind of like worth uh, discussing. I do think actually, just before we get into that, he kind of starts with a few aphorisms. Like this is the one basically, it's about art and it's women, it's about art, but then he'll have a few, there's a few like kind of 
like the digressions or different things elsewhere and he kind of like he actually puts something that's like a diff that's kind of um not quite related to that but it, it does like the 57 to the realists is kind of relevant to what we're talking about like the cult of rationality or the some side of things so it's um you sober people who feel well against passion and fantasies and would like to turn your emptiness into a matter of pride and an ornament. You call yourselves realists and hint that the world really is the way it appears to you, as if reality stood in veil before you only and you yourselves were perhaps the best part of it. Um, then, like, sorry, I'll just kind of like skip to the get. And what is reality for an artist? Look, you are still burdened with those estimates of things that have their origin in the passions and loves of former centuries. Your sobriety still contains a secret and an extinguishable drunkenness. Your love of reality, for example, oh, that is a primeval love. Every feeling and sensation contains a piece of this old love and some fantasy, some prejudice, some unreason, some ignorance, some fear, and ever so much as else has contributed to and worked on it. So, um, which I feel like, and the whole thing, I'll, I'll kind of just read that bit then, but like the whole thing is like a really good sort of refutation of that sort of rationality in that sense. Because like, it's something I, I, you know, I have seen in that where like, it's quite an immature viewpoint, not that like, but you see in politics too now where it's kind of, you know, um, feel art reels and all this like, fucking memes and like this sort of idea in general that like, if you factor emotions out of, or if you factor these personal considerations and oftentimes like what what's considered rational and what's considered this is like really just the interest the personal interests of the person that's saying it i think you and dan possibly touched on this in the jordan peterson video as well when he talked about like the way he talks about for example race and equality and that like as if it, it really is just sort of prioritizing the interests and the like of like the the class that he himself belongs to the dominant class as being inherently more rational than the needs and interests of those who are fighting against it and you know it, it is kind of in in general it's just like at the end of the day you can't like it, it's on a wider sense than the sort of like we are just perceiving things according to the parameters of that like, human perception that we've evolved to perceive it's not in, like we're always going to be within that that's going to play out you're always going to be influenced like emotionally hormonally you know like according to what's going on and and like this is and like Nietzsche does kind of talk in a number of aphorisms he explicitly will say that these things are playing out on a physiological level like sometimes he does say it in a way that might be dubious and not exactly bored but I think the general concept of it is one that like scientifically it's, it's hard to really argue with the fact that like for example hormones and those sort of changes do have like heavy cognitive effects like i mean i've seen for example in his work in healthcare like things like going on a course of steroids and that has like a very real effect on someone's mood and cognition like you'll get up you'll be buzzing you'll be this for the first few days and then like it then but then it can kind of like lead to feelings of depression in a way that like that entirely can affect somebody's like way of perceiving the world they're sort of slant on those things and it's just I, I think you just need to learn to like kind of acknowledge that and live with it and accept it and accept the way it's like no person is really an exception to that. Um, yeah, and, yeah. And, and it, it's actually the next aphorism where he uh, gets into this idea that um, you know reality does essentially change uh, by way yeah. of perception, yeah, so, yeah. you know, oftentimes. So yeah, that's the thing. I mean, oftentimes the structure it gets a little bit looser right once you get to the middle sections of each individual book, but. Uh, you know, there is definitely like a kind of like structural flow, kind of, you know, argumentation rhetoric from one piece to the next. Um, so actually, uh, I just want to, this is the start of women thing. And I do want to bring up actually 59, the next one, because I think this is something that, again, on a like literary way, I feel like this is like an interesting sort of juxtaposition to some of the stuff he said about women in the sense it all, also offers up one of those. So it, it's, um, Hold on. He uses, uh, ends up using it as a metaphor for sort of like the overall like view and the sort of scorn for like nature and the natural worlds that, you know, this obsession or fixating on the God and metaphysics offers. But it's um, when we love a woman, we easily conceive a hatred for nature on account of all the repulsive natural functions to which every woman is subject. We prefer not to think of all this, but when our soul touches on these matters for once, it shrugs as it were and looks contemptuously at nature. We feel insulted. Nature seems to encroach on our possessions and with the profanest hands at that. Then we refuse to pay any heed to physiology physiology and decree secretly. I want to hear nothing about the fact that a human being is something more than soul and form. So it's kind of like... I, I feel then like you can, I, I don't know, like you can sort of then, then see there's a certain aspect of like this one and also then the next one are both sort of somewhat being critical of 
not even of women as an actual group of specific people, but like as the concept or ideal of woman as it's been viewed through let's face it, male eyes, because the vast majority, if not all of philosophers in that history have like been men. And like, there is like just inherently, like there is like that sort of woman as an ideal woman as, you know, Helen of Troy that launched the boats, but like, it's the ideal, it's the image, it's the concept of a woman. So it's sort of like, there is a little bit of self, I, I guess, I, I don't know what I even say self-knowingness, but there is a little bit of kind of like, he himself is not exempt to that. He is able to criticize and able to recognize the fact that there are like certain follies or certain distinguishing between the way that like woman is viewed or whatever, but like then he sort of, you could argue, falls into that. But yeah, it's, 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 it's kind of an interesting like kind of nuance, I think. It's, it's interesting how it's these two, 57 and 58, right? It's these aphorisms that get into finally, you know, the subject of, of women, right? So there as a kind of preface, that's interesting, that's an interesting choice. But also like the title of yeah. 59, right, which you just read, we artists, right? Um, yeah. And then and then gets into this uh, uh, the discussion of women. Yeah. So this now starts the kind of like infamous uh, women uh, uh, sequence here. Um, so after 59, uh, another salient like set of comments that I found um like like 66 so like what do you what, what do you think about this maybe we could talk about this like in a more kind sure. of uh interpersonal way you know observations like the yeah. strength of the strength of the weak all women are subtle in exaggerating their weaknesses they are inventive when it comes to weaknesses in order to appear as utterly fragile ornaments where are hurt even by a speck of dust their existence is supposed to make men feel clumsy and guilty on that score thus they defend themselves against the strong and the law of the jungle um what what would what, you think when you uh read this do you think uh, he's onto something here or what honestly yeah like i don't like and okay like i i don't know like if i end up with comments or whatever that are criticizing this but like i really think that like there's something just like that's i don't even think that's particularly sexist like i, I just i don't think that's really like criticizing you, you know women or whatever i i think it's just kind of like it, it's the way it happens he's sort of like this is the particular like and, and it's just kind of like if you look from a historical and uh point of view and a, just a physical point of view like obviously as a woman like you're not going to be able to defend yourself physically or anything like that but like there are you know throughout history or whatever and like look we have to look at from a historical point of view as well and the fact he was also writing in the 1800s and i think a lot of these you got to look at them through a point of view of that he's like looking at this, at this sort of 1800s concept of femininity and womanhood and also of um you know like i guess a mid more middle class kind of like concept of womanhood and that sort of thing because that's the background he would have come from and it's kind of like like yeah that's absolutely sorry but that's absolutely going to be the case throughout like in that sort of background he's coming from but in general throughout history that has been the case like like as a woman that you would have needed like when when things come down to physical dangers and stuff like that you would have needed a group to protect you, you would have needed specifically like men to like in stuff the usual feminist like retort to like the statistics about when men you know are more likely to be the victim of violent crime is well that's from other men whereas if women are in the victim it's still victims from other men but it's like i i don't know i just like kind of feel like i don't know how relevant that is as a distinction to make yeah i, I agree it's not like, relevant yeah like i just think that like whenever i see that i'm like well what are like I, I think like that is such an easy response to make what you know if i i could get you know like on the street or whatever some guy thought me but it's like is that somehow worse than if i was a guy and i had I, I got mugged and assaulted on the street because like i know mm -hmm. guys that's happened to and like like to be honest just even anecdotally like yes i know plenty of women myself include that i've got harassed or you know like groped or whatever the hell but i also know guy i also would say i know more guys that have gotten outright like seriously injured if not out, like even like i know of people who've gotten like killed just because random like fucking like getting yeah. mistaken for someone else yeah. get the shit bit out of them and like they get hit like to in the wrong place in the head and end up dying or something like i mean it's like okay would i rather be a woman that's like a song or would i rather man well it's like an irrelevant distinction to make i'd rather neither of those things happen so why is this even a distinction we're making like what really are they trying to get at when they make this distinction yeah like i i don't know i i kind of so i do agree i just I'm very ambivalent when it comes to this kind of shit because I just like think it's it, it's sort of like you know I, I just sort of think a lot of these things get hung up on like weird irrelevancies and sort of conflations of things that like yeah like you're saying like why like well why are we making this distinction why is this really important and if in the wider scheme of the points we're trying to make yeah so 
yeah, it's just, and, and I can't think what it comes down to, like, we're talking about weakness here, but it's like, like, when you consider this being written in terms of the 1800s, like, that really, and especially, like, you know, Nietzsche was coming from a background, I believe, of, he wasn't coming from a well-off background, but he would have been coming from a, like, I guess, a probably middle class or, like, relatively bourgeois kind of background, I think, and, mm. um, like, I mean, that's really, like, that is the sort of power women wielded in that. Like, from what I, and I have read some biographicals of it seems that, like, his mother and his sister, especially, were very much in that kind of mold. His sister was quite an interesting person in some regard, but she very much was somebody who seemed to attach herself to powerful men for life as a way of, like, gaining her own sort of thing. So it's like, you got to consider, like, you know, like these are coming probably from this person, but the kind of many of the kind of women who surrounded were women who knew how to play this game. And I mean, yeah. like, and, and let it, so you might, so like that, and that was the case for women for the most part, that it was the case, even rel, just even relatively so. Like, even if you're a woman who wasn't this, you're privileged back then, if you came from, because like, I'm sure, like, my ancestors and probably yours as well weren't coming from that sort of a privileged background. They, you know, like they had to work or they had to do whatever, but still relative to the men, men in their lives, they were still maybe able to sort of take advantage of performing weakness at certain points maybe not to the degree of these like more well-to-do women but like relative to the men in their same class they you know it would have probably been more of an option for them like I, i'm sure like if i really want to like do like and i'm just not like not the sort of person like temperamentally or upbringing or anything else who is going to like for example turn on the crocodile tears to get what i want but if i wanted to i would have that option much more easily than you would yeah, I mean, I I agree about that, right? Um, yeah. and, and also, it's like, uh, it, I mean, in terms of this whole like crying thing, right? You mentioned like, uh, uh, you know, like, can can men be like less, you know, like stereotypically, uh, uh you know, like to toxic males, right? In terms of like they're not opening up emotionally, blah blah blah. It's sort of interesting when you look at Reddit threads, you know, and Reddit is a very very like liberal site, but yeah, if you look it at is. people deny it, but it is like it, yeah, it's it, overall. It, 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 it's it's an extremely liberal site overall. Of course, there's pockets of right wing shit. I mean, like whatever, but uh, it's a, it's a very liberal site. Um, and when you look at like something like Ask Men or or you look at some of these other subreddits, and always like I mean, you guys could Google this right now, right? Uh, with Reddit as the keyword, um, like why like like when the subject of like men opening up specifically to like female partners when that gets uh, brought up you see the same response with tons and tons of upvotes again and again and again. And keep in mind, these are, you know, these are liberal men, right? And the upvotes are likely also from like liberal guys that, you know, maybe they're not going to talk about this publicly because it doesn't look good, but uh, they're going to secretly upvote it. And it's like something along the lines of, yeah, like I, I heard all the time, you know, like open up mm, more, you yeah. know, cry, cry in front of your partner, do this, do that. And once I started doing that, my, you know, my girlfriend or whatever, or my wife totally lost her attraction to me. Right. And granted, okay, maybe they're doing it in a way that's like very bitchy and mopey and kind of like, yeah. uh, it's just like, you know, cause like, you know, I would not be attracted to a woman that's just like constant, like a fucking like mope ha hag, you know, like I don't want to see somebody moping all the time. I want, you know, I want, I want someone with like more classically masculine qualities. Mm -hmm. I want someone a bit more aggressive. I want someone But even like there's like a big middle ground between just being open and vulnerable and even able to like it, it, like you know some people just don't cry to be honest but like even yeah. if you're able to just be emotionally expressive there's a big middle ground between in, in, in like adult mature way versus like versus and I, I feel like this is a thing like that sometimes it falls into where you try like you want a girlfriend slash mommy slash therapist kind of thing like and that's a harsh way of putting it but i do i've seen those sort of threads you mentioned and mm -hmm. i do think there's a big middle ground sometimes where some of these guys are so like pent up emotionally that when they do allow it to come out it's this massive outpouring that to be honest like a lot of these are probably young guys they're dating young women like to be honest most people just don't know how to how to deal with that mm -hmm. even a lot a lot of men would not know i don't know how to deal with or don't particularly want to do a woman who's maybe has a lot of shit that like is just like being poured out on them and stuff like this like i, I do think it's a, i like i know the kind of threads you mentioned and i do think it's like i, I do think it's true to some extent that like that like honestly some of these things like i said it's kind of singling. it's like oh we want men to be more vulnerable but they're not prepared to like actually deal with the reality of that but then sometimes i i, I don't know i think like like it's kind of might be like the example i'm giving where it's like there are more like complicated factors and just immaturity like it's reddit majority mm -hmm. i will say it does skew towards people in their 20s or so and mm -hmm. like yeah and, and i mean i personally have like you know had like guys that i've known or dated or whatever like be like open up or whatever I'm kind of surprised or whatever it was like i i don't know so it's not something i personally have any issue with i guess 
mm-hmm. like emotional vulnerability in that written but like yeah it's I, I don't know I would say like to be honest again just maybe as a sort of counterbalance to all this and I, I don't know if anyone's like fucking like is it going to be listening to this and like ready to act like I kind of come from I, I suppose the background I come from and like a lot of women I know my family would like more so tend to be like the more women that wouldn't rely on like weakness as their primary tactic in this like they'd be much more your stoic kind of just put your head down and work like what are you trying for kind of attitude so I do think like there are more complicated social individual class factors you know cultural factors too I do think like uh, you know Irish culture would maybe be a bit more stoic in some ways like class like Mm -hmm. typically and classically and stuff so you know, I, I think there's a lot of stuff going on, but if, like, yeah, like, I mean, it's all relative, really. Like, still, it's like comes down to like it's relative, and it comes down to like we've got to consider the culture he was coming from at the time, and as well as anything else. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and I I agree. There's definitely a way to do things like opening up emotionally that could be you know totally uh, off the wall, right? And there's also uh, a healthy kind of middle ground, right? But it's this kind of odd situation that men find themselves in where. All right, so you you were never actually taught how to properly discuss your emotions, and mm-hmm. you know maybe maybe yeah. you are taught to stifle them, and also biologically, I mean, you're just going to st- stifle them just by virtue yeah. of being a male. Um, but yeah, you know, men do tend to find it like just like they don't. It's not as common to just cr- like tear up and cry as a response to women. Yeah. Like I've known, like I actually this is an interesting thing I noticed, and I've like talked like I noticed growing up because like I had all brothers, and um, I have also talked about male friends of mine, but like. Where after hitting puberty like they actually just like did not find themselves crying as much like if they were hurt yeah. or if they exactly. it's just like you yeah. just it's like a hormonal thing or something which I, I yeah i don't know i think like there's that aspect i think like it's well like maybe like if we go to the biological physiological thing men just don't necessarily aren't necessarily going to respond emotionally in the same way as women do and i do think that's a probably an issue with some of these discussions around toxic masculinity is that are we going to really place the feminine way of expressing emotions as inherently being the ideal way to do so like is there no middle ground or synthesis because certainly there is and i i think this comes back to the algorithm like you could even call what he's referring to there a form of toxic femininity like if we're mm-hmm. going to talk about this it's like you know there's like surely if we're going to like look at going forward some sort of synthesis or middle ground in terms of like you know just mm-hmm. maturity and not relying on either obsessively stifling these things only because like it's always going to end up coming out and uh, like person acts out or whatever if it's strong enough or on the other hand performatively displaying it and over exaggerating it because both aren't good and both and neither of those things should be viewed as as the ideal that the other sex should have to adapt themselves to in general yeah um yeah so like you know men men aren't aren't uh taught these things it comes out in a messy way well if you want them to open up you're gonna have to be prepared for the messiness you know mm-hmm. sorry yeah that's just that's yeah, just part absolutely. of this like new little social contract you're entering into yeah the, the, the this whole thing about uh like you said you know cry more cry more uh, uh men you know simply cry less uh you know after puberty or, or whatever that's just kind of like a biological thing yeah. Grand, there's, there's social elements as well but it's also biological and the whole crime or crime or thing that you see like on twitter on reddit like guys you got a crime or do it do it do it do it this whole kind of like nagging about it it reminds me so much of how you have this like low effort uh flirting right the guys do right they're walking around uh, they see some woman passing the street that they want to talk to. And she's like, you know, she's not smiling because she has no reason to smile. And he's like, hey, baby, smile more. What you crying about? Smile, yeah. smile, smile. You know, it's like the fucking inverse of that. It's like, no, I don't want to fucking smile. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to fucking cry. Don't, you know, like there's no, there's no reason for me. So like, so like, don't, day, it's, it's like, it's like, don't, don't dictate yeah. to me what my emotions need to be right now because it, it, I need to assuage some sort of ideological fervor in your head, like you know? It's objectification. You're, yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah, it's it, just it, like it, an objectification. It's like, yeah. I don't want to actually connect with you and accept, uh, accept as a person your foils and your tendencies and how you uniquely or specifically relate to the world or how you respond to things. I just want you to act in a way that's most amenable to like how I want you to act. And that's what it comes down to on both sides. And like, actually, that kind of leads in nicely to the next aphorism I've marked here where it's 68 and it kind of makes what, 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 again, what, what, what about what like, about what about what about 67 uh because so, what we just said it was not very oh, objectionable oh yeah, that one, yeah yeah what we just said is not very objectionable after 66 uh we both agree with it but 67 begins simulating oneself now she loves him and looks ahead with quiet confidence like a cow <laughs> um 
Yeah, so it get it gets uh, more and more uh, like it, he seesaws between things that are not objectionable, but perhaps edgy and things that are objectionable. Uh, so, would you want to say about sixty eight? Because I also have that marked I think out. Sixty seven though is interesting because, like, again, like I feel like if you look beneath the fact that like he, for his own whatever personal reason, needs to use language like this, it's like it kind of is a decent psychological insight about love and romantic relationships in the sense of saying. Alas, what bewitched him was precisely that she seemed utterly changeable and unfathomable. Mm -hmm. Of steady weather, he found too much in himself. Wouldn't she do well to simulate her old character, to simulate a lack of love? And I think, like, that's pretty, like, like, I know if you take, again, it's like one of those things, if you take it out of this sort of language it's couched in, it's, it's pretty fucking spot on because, like, you know, like, I'm sure, like, we know of, the, like, and you know, like, examples made from your own life or from friends and stuff like this that starts to bring up, like, it's just the interest fades, like a, a sort of discomfort and like and uh, but it also then on the other hand it's like that sort of thing of maybe attraction to others what you feel you lack in yourself and it's like which is also something that you do see like you do kind of see people who are looking to sort of like make up for a lack in themselves by sort of looking for in others and it's just like i don't think this even has to be gendered like i think that it's like certainly something i've seen on the other way around where like you know um you know with friends you know with friends of mine or anything where it's like they they like you know are interested in a guy and so like that because it seems the excitement and the drama of like um he just you know again he seemed utterly changeable and unfathomable and then the minute when things seem settled it's like well hang on what do i do with this now like again i i don't know i think it's like I, again you just have to pick through all this shit and, and put aside whatever psychological quirks and needs and Nietzsche led him on whatever problems he was having with you know like regard that Lou Salome kind of shit and whatever that led him to phrase things in this way and be like yeah he's still capable of coming up with something interesting and insightful so yeah and that's and, pretty much my overall stance on like this as a as a, like the collection of aphorisms but I think that yeah. one's a pretty good example to use of it and, you know, uh, in terms of like his own love interest, I mean, it, it, I think it's kind of interesting how he would have, uh, you know, this aphorism about female weakness, and he could sort of see that objectively, or this kind of like perverted uh, female weakness. And yet, who he's attracted to specifically is someone with very masculine qualities, right? Yeah, um, exactly, you know, he, yeah. And and I, I think that's the other thing, you know, the, the whole kind of like a femininity versus masculinity. Look, if you're a guy of sufficient value, you're going to be attracted to somewhat masculine women. You just will be, you know, like uh, you you don't want you don't want someone that's just kind of like some sort of a you know caricature stereotype, whatever of like female weakness or you know you don't you don't want that. That that's just not attractive. You know, maybe it's attractive to a certain kind of man in a certain kind of setting, especially in the past, but. You know, uh, in the present day, I think if you're, uh, you know, a healthy, well-adjusted man, uh, you're going to want somebody that is somewhat masculine. The same way that, you know, if you're if you're a healthy, well-adjusted woman, you also want a male with like some feminine qualities, right? And you're yeah, not going to like, be. And I would say specifically, like some of the, if we, and I, I like want to talk about like there being like a negative aspect or toxic femininity, like that whole we exaggerated weakness. There are also like feminine qualities that are virtuous and that are like actually good, and that it actually does like lend like you know it probably lends up well to like guys to try and emulate or cultivate that within themselves if it comes naturally to them so yeah i got what yeah. you mean and same for like the masculine like you don't necessarily like you know it's it's like you have this caricature and the idea of the girl boss and all this kind of shit like and it's just like you sometimes end up with like seeing it's like women think they need to emulate the like worst side like this machismo or whatever and all this mm -hmm. kind of unnecessary shit like so yeah, yeah. I, I one thing i've noticed in like my personal life uh is just how you know, you could tell the level of health, right, and maturity that someone has based on the level of how close they are to like, you know, either a masculine or a feminine sort of stereotype, you know, where it's like, um, like, 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 for instance, like I saw this tweet uh, from like some woman, this was a couple of years ago, and she was like, when I, when I, when I get a boyfriend and I meet his friend group for the first time, and he's not the leader, you know, I'm out of there. And it's like, well, what exactly yeah, does yeah. that mean? The, the leader of the friend group, like uh, of the of the male group, like what? Are you the guy that's organizing all the fucking like silly fucking shenanigans? Fortunately, I'd lean more cynically towards that. What the girl might have meant when, who wrote that tweet is that like, if you look at that play in practice there, the guy that's sort of like, you know, putting down the other guys and is, mm -hmm. you know, displaying his alpha hood that way. He's the one giving the other guys shit. He's the one like, you know, 
which mm-hmm. which again like that's like the whole I guess to- like more toxic or negative aspects of the masculine you know like it's just which again shouldn't be viewed positively uh well it also reminds me of like in terms of like to what extent you know uh men and women kind of embrace their most kind of caricatured selves nothing reminds me of like uh i i recently saw some study that said i don't know how true this is right or if they're going to recreate it but uh something like 85 percent of women set their uh dating like filters like on dating apps or whatever 85 percent of them uh uh only allow men that are six foot and higher right to basically like like and it's like you know the, you know these women that are like what like five eight five six five four right there, there's something very like it would be the same thing as like okay as a man i'm gonna set my dating preferences imagine they would roll out a feature like this uh women have to input their cup size and if you're a c cup or a d cup yeah. and higher those i'm only gonna i'm only gonna date and fuck yeah. you if you got if you got big titties right like it would just be so like it would be so immature and so like over the top silly it's like okay i understand there's like physical preferences and physical attraction but, but really the thing like about it is it's, it's like a weird proxy as well for actual physical attraction because it's yeah, like yeah. And what's happened is that I, I actually mentioned this. I can't remember as an example or something. As like guy, it's like, like become such a like like a joke and that and like around this stuff is that like every guy like give himself like two inches uh, like taller on these things. So it's like you're five ten, you're going to be six foot. Now if you're six foot, then you have to. It's like an inflation. So if you're actually six foot, you don't want to be lumped in with all those five foot ten mm-hmm. loves. You're going to say you're six foot two. <laughs> like mm-hmm. it actually, it, I'm pretty sure it does happen. But it's like I, I think it's dumb though because it's just that like. The, okay, if there is an actual element of physical attraction, it might be fair to say that on average, like a lot of women are going to prefer guys who are physically at least a bit taller than a bit bigger than them, whatever. But like mm-hmm. six foot just becomes this abstract idea that's attached to as a sort of arbitrary like frame of reference for this concept of taller than me. So it does it becomes like fetishized six you know six foot mm-hmm. tall like it's just like it's not it becomes sort of detached then from any actual reality of simply being attracted to a guy who's taller than you because like you know like you don't you don't need to most like women tall like I, like you know it, it's like becomes like silly at some stage if you're like five foot nothing and you need a you, you know you're gonna need a step ladder or some shit like when you're mm-hmm. next to this guy like you know and it's just kind of yeah it's just it's a weird almost example of like a weird kind of fetishization of an abstract thing to refer to this sort of like you know and it's just that's out of touch with like the reality of like actual attraction and i think unfortunately that's what dating apps do and i think that's kind of a lot of online stuff does that it lends itself to these sort of arbitrary markers becoming you know the same way as like how money or like you know you're into crypto and stuff so like like it's just kind of like this thing that just give becomes given a value but is detached from any actual tangible source of value in reality mm. like yeah it's it's a weird one yeah um, i've yeah, uh, I, I i've I've always been five eight on dating apps right because I, I like to show up five eight and act like i'm six four right i think that's <laughs> i think that i think that's the best way to actually deal with it like and that's like i see yeah, yeah. like 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 if you look at I mean, some on the other hand thing women lie about their weight on these dating apps. of course too, like, yeah from, yeah yeah but but, but they, but they like, don't but, but, but do, like. do they actually do they actually like put weight in there because that's the thing i feel like with a lot of like the female specific things because of the you know the whole kind of like uh you know there's been you know so much t- time spent on objectification so i feel like a lot of these dating apps they would not uh they would not like put like oh what is your cup size oh what is your weight they'd be like what you know well well i mean i guess depending like- on the app i don't know Pic- it depends on app, but like pictures are a thing. So like, which I feel is like they're not going to say oh, that way. Right, yeah, but they're yeah, going to yeah, take yeah, pictures, yeah. and they're going to take pictures that are like either those Snapchat filters that like yeah. make that like make you look like cuter and your face skinnier and stuff like that, or they're going to take pictures from angles that like make them you know like kind of are are their best angle and that maybe like you know make them look skinnier than they are or whatever mm-hmm. the hell, and just kind of like you know that's yeah. that's kind of yeah that's kind of which which you know I don't think is any better or worse than you know, like actually writing on you know that you're six yeah. foot when you're not but like it's just yeah it's it's kind of like it's yeah it, it's one of those things like day like that whole like could be a whole other tangent maybe if we get onto the bonus show or whatever that sort of 
and again it's like appearances and reality it's like after a while these appearances become what you're judged by in this entire like it, it kind of actually is like a weird like case in point of this idea of like the aphorism you know about appearances and like after a while if you like call something something enough that so that becomes a part of the essence like these dating weird dating app arbitrary metrics are having a very real effect on like people's real dating and sex lives they're becoming a very real like aspect it, it becomes in a way you're not actually being because before that not that the whole meat market that was necessarily any better back in the day um but like it's like at least you're being like judged according to things that are shallow but you can be said they have a sense of reality and a sense of mm. like tangibility to them so you might be judged on your height or your cup size or your weight or whatever else but like at least you can say well they are it is at the end of the day a real thing about you nowadays people are being judged essentially for how good they are at understanding and knowing how to play the dating app game which is it's like not actually a real thing it's sort of a more of a proxy for these other things because it's sort of like you're being judged not on well is this guy actually tall enough it's well he's smart enough and astute enough to know he needs to play the game and say he's two inches taller than he really is to get more mm. matches so he can meet potentially meet more girls so we can pretend you know the way it, it's like a weird thing you're being so it's it's like a different set of traits are being sort of selected for here like it's shallow but it's actually a worse kind of shallow in my opinion because it's a shallowness that is even more untethered from reality in any real sense mm. like it's it's worse than superficial like it's you know mm. it, it's like yeah it is interesting but yeah yeah. Um, maybe we could actually uh, finish up the section on women, right? That finishes, uh, I think. Uh, Can I just actually first the sixty-eight one? Because I, I'm only the whole thing is just there is another yeah. interesting thing here that I feel like is actually oddly progressive in this sense, or kind of or, or sympathetic. It has this quote in it, like has um, the concept of some going to a sage on the topic of women. So uh, the sage replies. It is men, said he, that corrupt women, and all the failings of women should be atoned by and improved in men. For it is man who creates for himself the image of woman, and woman forms herself according to this image. And, like, it's kind of, it's interesting because I don't think that's, like, at all contradictory with a lot of feminist thought or a lot of feminist concepts you'll see being talked about regarding like the feminine and regarding the patriarchy and how the like you know even going back to older like second wave feminism the concept of the patriarchy and how femininity is imposed is an idea that's imposed on women by men and that you have to try and reach it like i mean this is simply a rephrasing this or even nowadays when you see like talk about internalized misogyny like whether or not i'm not i'm not going to like what my opinions on that i'm just i think it's an interesting point to make that like this in no way contradicts what like a lot of these teachings it's actually very progressive in that sense and it's actually displays the fact that like, okay regardless about maybe his worst kind of ten nietzsche's worst tenants came out from time to time of this he was still like the better parts and were still very capable of like being quite understanding and even empathetic to the plight i guess or situation like i think like like you would very much want to compare the this succession even like some of them are a bit like like you know more flippant not as well but like i think if you overall compare this like succession of aphorisms to something like schopenhauer's essay on women which genuinely mm. is just like sexist vitriol this comes out miles ahead mm -hmm. you know it, course, it comes yeah. out very favorably like so sorry anyways if you want to move on then to and and, and the way that it ends right uh uh damn oil damn kindness someone else shouted out of the crowd women need to be educated better and the sage responds men need to be educated better said the sage and beckoned to the youth to follow him the youth however did not follow him right there's this yeah. kind of deeper you know social comment and i think you know among the most progressive things that he says about women that kind of uh um i mean like it, it just kind of shocks me for the period Every time that I read it, this is aphorism 71 on yeah. female chastity. There is something quite amazing and monstrous about the education of upper class women. What could be more paradoxical? All the world is agreed that they are to be brought up as ignorant as possible of erotic matters and that one has to imbue their souls with a profound sense of shame in such matters until the merest suggestion of such things triggers the most extreme impatience and flight. The honor of women really comes into play only here. What else would one not forgive them? But here they are supposed to remain ignorant even in their hearts. They are supposed to have neither eyes nor ears nor words nor thoughts for this. They're evil. And mere knowledge is considered evil. And then to be hurled as by a gruesome lightning bolt into reality 
and knowledge, by marriage, precisely by the man they love and esteem most, to catch love and shame in a contradiction and to be forced to experience at the same time delight, surrender, duty, pity, terror, and who knows what else in the face of the unexpected neighborliness of God and beast. Um, and then he finishes by saying, in sum, one cannot be too kind about women, right? Yeah. Um, it's, and it's, like, there's it's like no argument, right? like it's true. Like, okay, thankfully less true now, but like, um, it's, it's, it's incredibly true that that is like at the time he was writing, that was the plight that was the, that women faced. And that it's kind of remarkable in that to see it just being like expressed. So like, honestly, and frankly, and empathetically, uh, mm -hmm. the whole thing. And like, you know, I, I think it, it makes up for a lot of what he might say elsewhere. <laughs> that's, mm -hmm. you know, questionable. Um, um well, for the interest of time, uh, uh, maybe we should uh, uh, end this show here, then move the rest of the discussion on Nietzsche uh, and the gay science to the after show. Um, otherwise, uh, I think we're going to be too tired yeah. to even say anything else in the in the bonus show. So, uh, guys, if you want to get the rest of this conversation right, we're what on aphorism number uh, what was it seventy one? Right, there's like three hundred eighty or yeah. whatever in this book. So. There's a, a bunch more stuff to get through. So if you want to get that part of the conversation, that is automaccination.com. Uh, so sorry, sorry. That's the website. The Patreon is patreon.com slash automaccination. All right. Thank you guys for watching and we'll see you again soon. Okay. See you soon.